Attend, O oh reader, our tale of fantasy. Welcome back to Paper Cuts, everybody. Uh, last time we found ourselves in the Nautilus in the Red Sea, which is normally a one-way trip. And, uh, and, you know, the main character's like, hey, how are we getting out of the Red Sea? Why did we come in here? It's a one-way gateway. Uh, turns out, through the power of tagging some fish with copper rings, uh, Captain Nemo discovered that the that there is a subterranean tunnel uh, beneath a chunk of uh, Egypt, I believe, that allows the Nautilus, as a submarine, to leave the Red Sea. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, magnets. Do you see this criminal? Look at his beans. Look at his dirty, dirty little beans. Little crime boy. Illegal crime of scratch the wall. It's my, yeah. Illegal crime of scratch the wall. It's mildly annoying when he dig at the floor. It's not actually that much of a problem. But then he starts pawing at the wall, and it's like, I put effort into that paint, sir. I can see you using your claws. Now the world sees your beans, because you're a bad boy. Yeah. Thank you for your input. Are you done? Are you done being a little problems man? He's like, no, I am merely considering new angles for my problems, Father. Oh, pick quieter problems, please. <laughs> anyway, now that we've thoroughly embarrassed my cat. Don't worry, library's okay. He's, he's a good little boy. He's just loafing. Now that we've thoroughly embarrassed Magnus. Let us begin. Ooh, actually, I lied. Before we begin, I want to mention the tea I'm drinking. It's called Dr. Jekyll. I think that's a really cute literary reference. The blend, the tea blender I got it from uh, has a Dr. Jekyll and a Mr. Hyde blend. And I think they're both pretty great. Well, actually, I haven't had the Mr. Hyde blend, but the ingredients list looks good. <laughs> and the Dr. Jekyll blend is fantastic. Plus, like, the whole shop has, like, this whole steampunk thing. Anyway, I'm digressing literally before we have even read a single word. Bodes well for how much progress we're going to make. Anyway, let's get into Chapter 5, The Arabian Tunnel. That same evening, in 21 degrees, 30 minutes north latitude, the Nautilus floated on the surface of the sea, approaching the Arabian coast. I saw a jet... 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 Jeddah, Jeddah, the most important contiguous house of Egypt, Syria, Turkey, and India. I distinguish clearly enough that its buildings, the vessels anchored at the quays, and those whose draught of water obliged them to anchor in the roads. The sun, rather low on the horizon, struck full on the houses of the town, bringing out their whiteness. Outside, some wooden cabins and some made of reeds showed the quarter inhabited by the Bedouins. Soon Jetta was shut out from the view by the shadows of the night, and then almost found herself underwater, slightly phosphorescent. Sorry, I misclicked something and lost my place. The next day, the 10th of February, we sighted several ships running to Widward. The, the Nautilus returned to its submarine navigation, but at noon, when her bearings were taken, the sea being deserted, she rose again to her waterline. Accompanied by Ned and Conseil, I had seated myself on the platform. The coast on the eastern side looked like a mass faintly printed upon a damp fog. We were leaning on the sides of the pinnace, talking of one thing and another, when Ned Land, stretching out his hand toward a spot on the sea, said, Do you see anything there, sir? Uh, no, Ned, uh, but I haven't your eyes, you know. Look well, there on the starboard beam, about the height of a lantern. Do you not see a mass which seems to move? Uh, certainly. I, I see something, like a long black body on top of the water. 
and certainly before long the black object was not more than a mile from us. It looked like a great sandbank deposited in the open sea. It was a gigantic dugong. Ned Land looked eagerly. His eyes shone with covetousness at the sight of the animal. His hands seemed ready to harpoon it. One would have thought he was awaiting the moment to throw himself into the sea and attack it in its element. At this instant, Captain Nemo appeared on the platform. So, seeing the dugong, understood the Canadian's attitude, and addressing him, said, If you held a harpoon just now, Master Land, would it not burn your hand? It's just so, sir. And would you not be sorry to go back for one day to your trade of a fisherman, and add to this... Add this citation to the list, the list of those you've already killed. I should not, sir. Well, you can try. Thank you, sir, said Ned Land, his eyes flaming. Only, uh, only I advise you, for your own sake, not to miss the creature. Is the Dukong dangerous to attack? I asked, in spite of the Canadian shrug of the shoulder. Yes, sometimes the animal turns upon its assailants and overturns their boat. But for Master Land, this danger is not to be feared. His eye is prompt, his, uh, his arm sure. At this moment, seven, seven men of the crew, mute and immovable as ever, mounted the platform. One carried a harpoon and a line similar to those employed in catching whales. The pinnace was lifted from the bridge, pulled from its socket, and let down into the sea. Six oarsmen took their seats, and the... And the Oxlade? I'm pretty sure that's how you say that. Uh, yeah. And the coxswain went to the tiller. Ned, Conseil, and I went to the back of the boat. You're not coming, Captain? No, sir, but I wish you good sport. The boat put off and lifted by the six rowers drew rapidly towards the dugong, which floated about two miles from the Nautilus. Arrived some cable's length from the station, the speed slackened and the oars dipped noiselessly in the quiet waters. Ned Land, harpoon in hand, stood in the fore part of the boat. The harpoon used for striking the whale is generally attached to a very long cord which runs out rapidly as the wounded creature draws it after. But here the cord was not more than ten fathoms long, and the extremity was attached to a small barrel which, by floating, was to show the course the dugong took under the water. I stood and carefully watched the Canadian's adversary. This dugong, which also bears the name of the Halicor, closely resembles the manatee. Its oblong body, terminated in a lengthened tail, and its lateral fins and perfect fingers. Its difference from the manatee consisted in its upper jaw, which was armed with two long and pointed teeth, which formed on each side diverging tusks. The dugong, which Ned Lane was preparing to attack, was a colossal dimension. It was more than seven yards long, and it didn't move. It seemed to be sleeping on the wave, which circumstance made it easier to capture. Magnus, we've discussed the, the pawing at cables, man. It's going to get you. The cables are going to reach out, and they're going to bite you. Yeah, they're going to reach out, and they're going to bite you. And I'm going to be very sad when they do. you got to leave cables alone, man. There we go. Good boy. Lie down. Oh. Yeah. The boat approached within six yards of the animal. The oars rested on the rowlocks, and I half rose. Ned Land, his body thrown a little back, brandished the harpoon in an experienced hand. Suddenly, a hissing noise was heard, and the dugong disappeared. The harpoon, although thrown with great force, had apparently only struck the water. Curse it, I have missed it. No, the creature's wounded. Look at the blood, but your weapon isn't stuck in the body. My harpoon, my harpoon, cried Ned Land. The, sowers, the sailors rowed on and made for the floating barrel. The harpoon regained, we followed in pursuit of the animal. The latter came, now and then, to the surface to breathe. Its wound had not weakened it, for it shot onwards with great rapidity. The boat, being rowed by strong arms, flew on its track. Several times it approached within some few yards, and the Canadian was ready to strike, but the dugong made off with a sudden plunge, and it was impossible to reach it. Imagine the passion which excited impatient Ned, Ned Land. He hurled at the most unfortunate creature an energetic expletive in the English tongue. 
for my part, I was only vexed to see the dugong escape all our attacks. We pursued it without relaxation for an hour, and I began to think it would prove difficult to capture when the animal, possessed with the perverse idea of vengeance of which he had cause to repent, turned upon the pinnace and assailed us in its turn. This maneuver didn't escape the Canadian. Look out! The coxswain showed, said some words in his outlandish tongue, doubtless warning the men to keep on their guard. The dugong came within twenty feet of the boat, stopped, sniffed the air briskly with its large nostrils, not pierced at the extremity, but in the upper part of its muzzle, and then taking a spring, threw himself upon us. The pinnace could not avoid the shock, and, half upset, shipped at least two tons of water which had to be emptied. But thanks to the coxswain, we caught it sideways, not full front, so we weren't quite overturned. While Ned Land, clinging to the bows, belabored the gigantic animal with blows from his harpoon, the creature's teeth were buried in the gunwale, and it lifted the whole thing out of the water, as a lion does a roebuck. We were upset one another. We were upset over one another, and I know not how the adventure would have ended if the Canadian, still enraged with the beast, had not struck it to the heart. I heard its teeth grind on the iron plate, and the dugong disappeared, carrying the harpoon with it. But the barrel soon returned to the surface and shortly after the body of the animal turned on its back. The boat came up with it, took it in tow, and made straight for the Nautilus. It required tackle of enormous strength to hoist the dugong onto the platform. It weighed 10,000 pounds. The next day, 11th February, was the larder of the Nautilus was enriched by some more delicate game. A flight of sea swallows rested on the Nautilus. It was a species of the Sternon Niloctia, peculiar to Egypt. Its beak is black, head gray and pointed, the eye surrounded by white spots, the back, wings, and tail of a grayish color, the belly and throat white and claws red. They also took some dozen of Nile ducks, a wild bird of high flavor, its throat and upper part of the head white with black spots. About five o'clock in the evening, we sighted to the north the Cape of Ras Mohammed. This cape forms the extremity of the Arabia Petraea, comprised between the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba. The Nautilus penetrated into the Straits of Ubal, which lead to the Gulf of Suez. I distinctly saw a high mountain towering between the two gulfs of Ras Mohammed. It was Mount Oreb, at Sinai, at the top of which Moses saw God face to face. At six o'clock, the Nautilus, sometimes floating, sometimes immersed, passed some distance from Tor, situated at the end of the bay, the waters of which seemed tinted with red, an observation already made by Captain Nemo. The night fell in the midst of a heavy silence, sometimes broken by the cries of the pelican and other night birds, and the shores of the waves breaking upon the sh and the noise of the waves breaking upon the shore, rather, chafing against the rocks, or the panting of some, or the panting of some far-off steamer beating the waters of the Gulf with its noisy paddles. From eight to nine o'clock, the Nautilus remained some fathoms under the water. According to my calculation. We must have been very near Suez. Through the panel of the saloon, I saw the bottom of the rocks brilliantly lit up by our electric lamp. We seemed to be leaving the straits behind us, more and more. At a quarter past nine, the vessel, having returned to the surface, I mounted the platform. Most impatient to pass through Captain Nemo's tunnel, I couldn't stay in one place, and so I came to breathe the fresh night air. Soon, in the shadow, I saw a pale light half discolored by the fog, shining about a mile from us. A floating lighthouse, said someone near me, and I turned, seeing the captain. It's the floating light of Suez. We will not be long before we gain the entrance of the tunnel. That entrance can't be easy. No, sir. For that reason, I'm accustomed to go to the steersman's cage and myself direct our course. And now, if you'll go down, Monsieur Arnax, the Nautilus is going under the waves, we will not return to the surface until we've passed through the Arabian Tunnel. Captain Nemo led me toward the central staircase. Halfway down, he opened a door, traversed the upper deck, and landed in the pilot's cage, which it may be remembered rose at the extremity of the platform. It was a cabin measuring six feet square, very much like that of occupied by a pilot on the steamboats of the Mississippi or the Hudson. In the midst worked a wheel, placed vertically, and caught to the tiller rope, which ran to the back of the Nautilus. Four light ports with lenticular glasses led in a groove in the partition of the cabin. cabin allowed the man at the wheel to see in all directions. The cabin was dark, but soon my eyes accustomed themselves to the obscurity, and I perceived the pilot, a strong man with his hands resting on the spokes of the wheel. 
Outside, the sea appeared vividly lit up by the lantern, which shed its rays from the back of the cabin to the other extremity of the platform. Now, let us try to make our passage. Electric wires connected the pilot's cage with the machinery room, and from there the captain could communicate simultaneously to his Nautilus the direction and the speed. He pressed the metal knob, and at once the speed of the screw diminished. I looked in silence at the high, straight wall we were running by at this moment, the immovable base of a massive, sandy coast. We followed it thus for an hour only some few yards off. Captain Nemo, however, did not take his eye from the knob suspended by its two concentric circles in the cabin. At a simple gesture, the pilot modified the course of the Nautilus every instant. I had placed myself at the port scuttle, and saw some magnificent substructures of coral, zoophytes, seaweed, and fucus, agitating their enormous claws which stretched out from the fissures of the rock. At a quarter past ten, the captain himself took the helm. A large gallery, black and deep, opened before us. The Nautilus went boldly into it. A strange roaring was heard round its side. It was the water of the Red Sea, which the incline of the tunnel precipitated violently toward the Mediterranean. The Nautilus went with a torrent, speed as rapid as an arrow, in spite of our, the efforts of our machinery, which, in order to offer more effective resistance, beat the waves with a reversed screw. On the walls of the narrow passage I could see nothing but brilliant rays, straight lines, furrows of fire, traced by the great speed under the brilliant electric light. My heart beat fast. At thirty-five minutes past ten, Captain Nemo quitted the helm and, turning to me, said, The Mediterranean. In less than twenty minutes, the Nautilus, carried along by the torrent, had passed through the Isthmus of Suez. Isn't that wild? <laughs> Even to a modern, modern reader, that's just absolutely like a wild amount of time to do that in, especially if you're not interacting with the, uh, with the Suez Canal, you know. And the Suez Canal actually was made by the time this book was written, and it was actually mentioned uh, last episode. So that's just something fun to keep in mind. Alright, Chapter 6, The Grecian Archipelago. The next day, the 12th of February, at the dawn of day, the Nautilus rose to the surface. I hastened onto the platform once more. Three miles to the south, the dim outline of Pelusium was to be seen. A torrent had carried us from one sea to another. About seven o'clock, Ned and Conseil joined me. Well, sir naturalist, and the Mediterranean? We're floating on its surface, friend Ned. What, this very night? Yes, this very night. In a few minutes, we've passed the impassable isthmus. I do not believe it. Then you're wrong, Mr. Land. This low coast which rounds off to the south is the Egyptian coast. And you have such good eyes, Ned. You can see the petty of the jetty of Port Said stretching into the sea. And the Canadian looked attentive. Certainly you are right, sir, and your captain is a first rate man. We are in the Mediterranean. Good. Now, if you please, let us talk of our own little affair, but so that no one hears us. I saw what the Canadian wanted, and in any case, I thought it would be better to let him talk, as he wished it. So we all three went and sat down near the lantern, where we were less exposed to the spray of the plagues. Now, Ned, we're listening. What have you to tell us? What I have to tell you is very simple. We are in Europe, and before Captain Nemo's capricious, drag us once more to the bottom of the polar seas or lead us into Oceania, I ask to leave the Nautilus. I wished in no way to shackle the liberty of my companions, but I certainly felt no desire to leave Captain Nemo. Thanks to him and thanks to his apparatus, I was each day nearer the completion of my submarine studies, and I was rewriting my book of submarine depths in its very element. Should I ever again have such an opportunity of observing the wonders of the ocean? No, certainly not. And I couldn't bring myself to the idea of abandoning, abandoning the Nautilus before the cycle of investigation was accomplished. Friend Ned, answer me frankly. Are you tired of being on board? Are you sorry that destiny has thrown us into Captain Nemo's hands? The Canadian remained some moments without answering, and then crossing his arms, he said, Frankly, I do not regret this journey under the seas. I shall be glad to have made it, but now that it is made, let us have done with it. That's my idea. It'll come to an end, Ned. 
There then. Where I do not know, when I cannot say. Rather, I suppose it will end when these seas have nothing more to teach us. Then what do you hope for? That circumstances may occur as well. Six months hence now, we may and ought to profit. No, and where shall we be in six months, if you please, Mr. Naturalist? Perhaps in China. You know the Nautilus is a rapid traveler. It goes through water as swallows do through the air, or as an express train on the land doesn't fear frequented seas. Who can say that it may not beat the coasts of France, England, or America, on which flight may be attempted as advantageously as here? Monsieur Alnac, your arguments are rotten at the foundation. You speak in the future. We shall be there. We shall be there. I speak in the present. We are here, and we must profit by it. Ned Land's logic pressed me hard, and I felt myself beaten on that ground. I knew not what argument would now tell in my favor. Sir, let us suppose an impossibility. If Captain Nemo should this day offer you your liberty, would you accept it? I do not know. And if the offer made you this day was never to be renewed, would you accept it? Friend Ned, this is my answer. Your reasoning's against me. We must not rely on Captain Nemo's goodwill. Common prudence forbids him to set us at liberty. On the other side, prudence bids us profit by the first opportunity to leave the Nautilus. Monsieur Arnax, that's wisely said. Only one observation. Just just the one. The occasion must be serious, and our first attempt must succeed. If it fails, we'll never find another, and Captain Nemo will never forgive us. All that is true, but your observation applies equally to all attempts at flight, whether in two years' time or in two days. But the question is still this. If a favorable opportunity presents itself, it must be seized. Agreed. Ned, tell me what you mean by a favorable opportunity. It will be that which, on a dark night, will bring the Nautilus a short distance from some European coast. And you'll try to save yourself by what? Swimming? Yes, if we were near enough to the bank and the vessel was floating at the time. Not if the bank was far away, the boat was under the water. In that case? In that case, I should seek to make myself master of the penis. I know how it is worked, we must get inside, and the boats, once drawn, we shall come to the surface of the water, without even the pilot, who is in the bows, perceiving our flat. Well, Ned, you watch for that opportunity, but don't forget that a hitch being caught will ruin us. I will not forget, sir. Now, Ned, would you like to know what I think of your project? Uh, certainly, Monsieur Arnaz. Well, I think, I do not say hope. I think that this favorable opportunity will never present itself. You may not. Because Captain Nemo cannot hide from himself that we have not given up all hope of regaining our liberty. He'll be on his guard above all in the, in the seas in sight of European coasts. Ah, uh, we shall see. Now, Ned, let's stop here. Not another word on the subject. The day that you're ready, come and let us know, and we will follow you. I'll, re I'll rely entirely on you. Thus ended a conversation which at no very distant time led to such grave results. I must say here that the facts seem to confirm my foresight, to the Canadian's great despair. Did Captain Nemo distrust us in these frequent seas, or did he only wish to hide himself from numerous vessels of all nations which plowed the Mediterranean? I couldn't tell, but we were oftener between waters and far from the coast. Or if the Nautilus did emerge, nothing was to be seen but the pilot's cage, and Sometimes it went to great depths, for between the Grecian, Ar the Grecian archipelago and Asia Minor, we couldn't touch the bottom by more than a thousand fathoms. Thus I only knew we were near the island of Carpath Carpathos, one of the sporades by Captain Nemo reciting these lines from Virgil. As Carpathio, Neptuni, Gurgite, Vates, Cerulius, Proteus, as he pointed to a spot on the plain sphere. It was indeed the ancient abode of Pro Pro Proteus, the old shepherd of Neptune's flocks, now the island of Scarpanto, situated between Rhodes and Crete. I saw nothing but granite base through the glass panels of the saloon. The next day, the 14th of February, I resolved to employ some hours in studying the fishes of the archipelago, but for some reason or another the panels remained hermetically sealed. Upon taking the course of the Nautilus, I found that we were going toward Can Canada. Can Canada? Oh, can Can Candia, the ancient isle of Crete. Reading hard, apparently. I found that we were going towards Candia, the ancient isle of Crete. 
At the time I embarked on the Abraham Lincoln, the whole of this island had risen in insurrection against the despotism of the Turks. But how the insurgents had fared since that time, I was absolutely ignorant, and it wasn't Captain Nemo, deprived of all land communications, who could tell me. I made no allusion to this event when that night I found myself alone with him in the saloon. Besides, he seemed to be taciturn and preoccupied. Then, contrary to his custom, he ordered both panels to be opened, and going from one to the other, observe the mass of waters attentively. To what end, I couldn't guess. So on my side, I employed my time in studying the fish passing before my eyes. In the midst of the waters, a man appeared, a diver, carrying in his belt a leather purse. It wasn't a body abandoned to the waves, it was a living man, swimming with a strong hand, disappearing occasionally to take a breath at the surface. I turned toward Captain Nemo, and in an agitated voice exclaimed, A, a man shipwrecked! He must be saved at any price! The captain didn't answer me, but came and leaned against the panel. The man had approached, and with his face flattened against the glass, was looking at us. To my great amazement, Captain Nemo signed to him. The diver answered with his hand, mounted immediately to the surface of the water, and didn't appear again. Do not be uncomfortable. It's Nicholas of Cape Matapan. Surname Pesca. He's well known in all the cichlids. A bold diver. Water is his element, and he lives more on it than on land, going continually from one island to another, even as far as Crete. You know him, Captain? Why not, Monsieur Arnax? Saying which, Captain Nemo went toward a piece of furniture standing near the left panel of the saloon. Near this piece of furniture I found a chest bound with iron, on the cover of which was copper plate, bearing the cipher of the Nautilus with its device. At that moment, the captain, without noticing my presence, opened the piece of the furniture, a sort of strong box, which hold it, held a great many ingots. They were ingots of gold. From whence came the precious metal, which represented an enormous sum? Where did the captain gather this gold from? What was he going to do with it? I didn't say one word. I just looked. Captain Nemo took the ingots one by one and arranged them methodically in the chest, which he filled entirely. I estimated the contents at more than 4,000 pound weight of gold. That's that's a lot of money. <laughs> Sorry, that is to say nearly 200,000 lira. The chest was securely fastened, and the captain wrote an address on the lid in characters which must have belonged to modern Greece. This done, Captain Nemo pressed a knob, the wire of which communicated with the quarters of the crew. Four men appeared, and, not without some trouble, pushed the chest out of the saloon, Then I heard them hoisting it up the iron staircase by means of some pulleys. At that moment, Captain Nemo turned to me. Uh, you were saying, sir? I was saying nothing, Captain. Then, sir, if you'll allow me, I'll wish you good night. At this, he turned and left the saloon. I returned to my room much troubled, as one may believe. I vainly tried to sleep, seeking the connecting link between the apparition of the diver and the chest filled with gold. Soon I felt by certain pitching movements and tossing of the Nautilus that we were leaving the depths and returning to the surface. Then I heard steps upon the platform, and I knew they were unfastening the pinnace and launching it upon the waves. For one instant it struck the side of the Nautilus, then all noise ceased. Two, after his hour, two hours after... The same coming and going was renewed. The boat was hoisted on board, replaced in its socket, and the Nautilus again plunged under the waves. So these millions had been transported to the point of their address. To what point of the continent? Who was Captain Nemo's correspondent? The next day I related to Conseil and the Canadian the events of the night, which had excited my curiosity to the highest degree. My companions were not less surprised than myself. Where does he take his millions to? To that, there was no reasonable answer. I returned to the saloon after having breakfast and set to work. Till five o'clock in the evening, I employed myself in arranging my notes. At that moment, ought I to attribute it to some peculiar idiosyncrasy, I felt so great a heat I was obliged to take off my coat. It was strange. We were under low latitudes, and even then the Nautilus, submerged as it was, ought to experience no change of temperature. I looked at the manometer. It showed a depth of 60 feet. Atmospheric, atmospheric heat should never attain here. I continued my work, but the temperature rose to such a pitch as to be intolerable. Would there be a fire on board? I was leaving the saloon when Captain Nemo entered, 
approaching the thermometer, consulted it, and said, 42 degrees. I've noticed it, Captain. If it gets much hotter, we can't bear it. Oh, sir, it will not get better if we do not wish it. You can reduce it as you please, then? No, but I can go farther from the stove which produces it. It's outward? Certainly. We're floating in a current of boiling water. Th th that's possible? Look, then. The panels opened, and I saw the sea entirely white all round. A sulfurous smoke was curling amid the waves, which boiled like water in a copper. I placed my hand on one of the panes of glass, but the heat was so great I quickly took it off again. Where are we? Near the island, near the island of Santorin, sir. I wish to give you a sight of the curious spectacle of a submarine er eruption. I thought the formation of these new li islands had ended. Nothing has ever ended in the volcanic parts of the sea. The globe is always being worked by subterranean fires. Already in the nineteenth year of our era, according to Cassiodorus and Pliny, a new island, Thea, appeared in the very place where these islets had recently been formed. Then they sank under the waves, to rise again in the year 69, when they again subsided. Since that time to our days, the Plutonian work has been suspended. But on the 3rd of February, 1866, a new island, which they named George Island, emerged from the midst of the sulfurous vapor near Nea Kamini, and settled again after the 6th of the same month. Seven days after, the 13th of February, the island of Afresa appeared, leaving between Nea Kamini and itself a canal ten yards broad. I was in the seas when these phenomena occurred. I was able to observe all the different phases. The island of Afresa, of round form, measured 300 feet in diameter and 30 feet in height. It was composed of black and vitreous lava mixed with fragments of feldspar. And lastly, on the 10th of March, a smaller island, called Rekka, showed itself near Nea Kamini, and since then these three have joined together, forming but the one and same island. And the canal we're in at the moment? Here it is, replied Captain Nemo, showing me a map of the ar archipelago. I've marked the new islands. I returned to the glass, and the Nautilus was no longer moving, the heat becoming unbearable. The sea, which till now had been white, was red owing to the presence of salts of iron. In spite of the ship's being hermetically sealed, an insupportable smell of sulfur filled the saloon, and the brilliancy of the electricity was entirely extinguished by bright scarlet flames. I was in a bath. I was choking. I was broiled. We can remain no longer in the spoiling water. It would not be prudent. An order was given, and the Nautilus tacked about and left the furnace it could not brave with impunity. A quarter of an hour after we... A quarter of an hour after, we were breathing fresh air on the surface. The thought struck me that if Ned Land had chosen this part of the sea for our flight, we should never should have come alive out of this sea of fire. The next day, the 16th of February, we left the basin, which, between Rhodes and Alexandria, is reckoned about 1,500 fathoms in depth, and the Nautilus, passing some distance from Serigo, quitted the Grecian archipelago after having doubled Cape Modipo. Oh. Excuse my yawning. Oh, I almost forgot to mention, we got a follower between streams. Uh, welcome to the Igloo Measly Meatloaf. Uh, they were who we went and said hi to after the end of last week's stream. Let me make sure I got all my yawns out before we dive into the next chapter, shall we? Come on, I got one more in there. I can tell. Give me a moment. Oh, there we go.
Uh, all right, let's dive into chapter 7, the Mediterranean in 48 hours. The Mediterranean, the blue sea par excellence, the great sea of the Hebrews, the sea of the Greeks, the Hebrews rather. Wow, that was a terrible flub. Let's just start the sentence over. The Mediterranean, the blue sea par excellence, the great sea of the Hebrews, the sea of the Greeks, the Mare Nostrum of the Romans, bordered by orange trees, aloes, cacti, and sea pines, embalmed with the perfume of the myrtle, surrounded by rude mountains, saturated with pure and transparent air, but incessantly worked by underground fires, a perfect battlefield in which Neptune and Pluto still dispute the empire of the world. It is upon these banks and on these waters, says Michelet, that man is renewed in one of the most powerful climates of the globe, but beautiful as it was, I could only take a rapid glance at the basin, whose superficial area is two million of square yards. Even Captain Nemo's lost knowledge was lost to me, for this puzzling person did not appear once during our passage at full speed. I estimated the course which the Nautilus took under the waves of the sea at about 600 leagues, and it was accomplished in 48 hours. Starting on the morning of the 16th of February, from the shores of Greece, we had crossed the streets of Gilbatrar by sunrise on the 18th. It was plain to me that this Mediterranean, enclosed in the midst of those countries which he wished to avoid, was distasteful to Captain Meem. Those waves and those breezes brought back too many remembrances, if not too many regrets. Here he had no longer that independence and that liberty of gait which he had when he was in the open seas, and his Nautilus felt itself cramped between the close shores of Africa and Europe. Our speed was now twenty-five miles an hour. It may be well understood that Ned Land, to his great disgust, was obliged to renounce his intended flight. He couldn't launch the pinnace, going at the rate of twelve or thirteen yards every second. To quit the Nautilus under such conditions would be as bad from jumping from a train going at full speed. An imprudent thing, to say the least of it. Besides, our vessel only mounted to the surface of the waves at night to renew its stock of air. It was steered entirely by compass and log. I saw no more of the interior of this Mediterranean than a traveller by express train perceives of the landscape which flies before his eyes. That is to say, the distant horizon, and not the nearer objects, which pass like a flash of light. We were then passing between Sicily and the coast of Tunis. In the narrow space between Cape Bon and the Straits of Messina, the bottom of the sea rose almost suddenly. There was a perfect bank on which there was not more than nine fathoms of water, whilst on either side the depth was ninety fathoms. The Nautilus had to maneuver very carefully, so as to not strike against the submarine barrier. I showed Conseil, on the map of the Mediterranean, the spot occupied by this reef. But if you please, sir, it's like a real isthmus joining Europe to Africa. Yes, my boy, it forms a perfect bar to the Straits of Libya, and the surroundings of Smith have proved that, or rather the soundings of Smith, have proved that in former times the continents between Cape Boko and Cape, For Cape Farina were joined. I can well believe it. I will add that a similar barrier exists between Gibraltar and, Su and Suda. Suda? Suda. We're going to say Suda. Uh, that a similar barrier exists between Gibra Gibraltar and Suda, which in geological times formed the entire Mediterranean. What if some volcanic burst should one day rise these two barriers above the waves? It's not probable, Conseil. But, well, but allow me to finish, please, sir. If this phenomenon should take place, it will be troublesome for Monsieur Lesseps, who's taken so much pains to pierce the isthmus. I agree with you, but I repeat, Conseil, that phenomenon will never happen. The violence of subterranean force is ever diminishing. Volcanoes, so plentiful in the first days of the world, are being extinguished by degrees. The internal heat is weakened, the temperature of the lower strata of the globe is lowered by a perceptible quantity every century to the detriment of our globe, for the heat is its life. But the sun? The sun's not sufficient, Conseil. Can it give heat to a dead body? Not that I know of. Well, my friend, this earth will one day be that cold corpse. It'll become uninhabitable and uninhabited, like the moon, which has long since lost all its vital heat. In how many centuries? In some hundreds of thousands of years, my boy. Then we shall have time to finish our journey. 
That is, if Ned Land doesn't interfere with it. And Conseil, reassured, returned to the study of the ba study of the bank, which the Nautilus was skirting at a moderate speed. During the night of the 16th and the 17th of February, we had entered the second Mediterranean basin, the greatest depth of which was 1,450 fathoms. The Nautilus, by the action of its crew, slid down the inclined planes and buried itself at the lowest depths of the sea. On the 18th of February, about three o'clock in the morning, we were at the entrance of the Straits of Gil Gibraltar. 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 Why can't I say that? We were at the entrance of the Straits of Gibraltar. There once existed two currents, an upper one, long since recognized, which conveys the waters of the ocean into the basin of the Mediterranean, and a lower countercurrent, which reasoning has now shown to exist. Indeed, the volume of the water in the Mediterranean, incessantly added to by the waves of the Atlantic and by rivers falling into it, would each year raise the level of this sea, for its evaporation is not sufficient to restore the equilibrium. As it's not so, we must necessarily admit the existence of an undercurrent, which empties into the basin of the Atlantic, through the Straits of Gibraltar, the surplus waters of the Mediterranean. A fact indeed, and it was this countercurrent by which the Nautilus profited. It advanced rapidly by the narrow pass. For one instant I caught a glimpse of the beautiful ruins of the Temple of Hercules, buried in the ground, according to Pliny, and with the low island which supports it. And a few minutes later we were floating on the Atlantic. Make sure there's not any more yawns waiting to sneak up on me. And there was. Glad I waited. Chapter... Chapter 8. In Vigo Bay. The Atlantic. A vast sheet of water whose superficial area covers 25 millions of square miles, the length of which is 9,000 miles, with a mean breadth of 2,700. An ocean whose parallel winding shores embrace an immense circumference, watered by the largest rivers of the world, the St. Lawrence, the Mississippi, the Amazon, the Plata, the Orinco, the, the Niger, the Senegal, the Elbe, the Loire, and the Rhine, in which carry water from the most civilized as well from the most savage countries magnificent field of water incessantly plowed by the vessels of every nation sheltered by the flags of every nation and which terminates in these two horrible points so dreaded by mariners cape horn and the cape of tempests the nautilus was piercing the water with sharp spur after having accomplished nearly ten thousand leagues in three months and a half a distance greater than the great circle of the earth where were we going now what was reserved for the future the Nautilus, leaving the Straits of Gibraltar, had gone far out. It returned to the surface of the waves, and our daily walks on the platform were restored to us. I mounted at once, accompanied by Ned Land and Conseil. At a distance of about twelve miles, Cape St. Vincent was dimly to be seen, forming the southwestern point of the Spanish peninsula. A strong southerly gale was blowing. The sea was swollen and billowy. It made the Nautilus rock violent. It was almost impossible to keep one's foot on the platform, which the heavy rolls of the sea beat over every, every instant. So we descended after inhaling some mouthfuls of fresh air. I returned to my room, concealed to his cabin, but the Canadian, with a preoccupied air, followed me. Our rapid passage across the Mediterranean had not allowed him to put his project into execution, and he would not help showing his disappointment. When the door of my room had shut, he sat down and looked at me, silent. Friend Ned, I understand you, but you can't reproach yourself. To have attempted to leave the Nautilus under those circumstances, it would have been folly at best. Ned Land didn't answer. His compressed lips and frowning brow showed with him the violent expression this fixed idea had taken of his mind. Let us see. We needn't despair yet. We're going up the coast of Portugal again. France and England aren't far off, where we can find refuge pretty easily. Now, if the Nautilus, on leaving the Straits of Gibraltar, had gone to the south, if it had carried us toward regions where there are no continents, I would share your unease, but we know now that Captain Nemo doesn't fly from civilized seas, and some days I think you can act with security. 
Ned Land still looked at me fixedly. At length his fixed lips parted and he said, It is for tonight. I drew myself up sudden. I was, I admit, little prepared for that communication. I wanted to answer the Canadian, but words wouldn't come. He agreed to wait for an opportunity, and the opportunity, the, the opportunity has arrived. This night shall be but a few miles from the Spanish coast. It is cloud. The wind blows freely. I have your word, Monsieur Alnax, and I rely upon you. As I was silent, the Canadian approached me. Tonight at nine o'clock, I have one conseil. At that moment, Captain Nemo will be shut up in his room, probably in bed. Neither the engineers nor the ship's crew can see us. Conseil and I will gain the central staircase, and you, Monsieur Alnax, will remain in the library, two steps from us, awaiting my signal. The oars, the mast, and the sail are waiting in the canoe. I have even succeeded in getting some provisions. I have procured an English wrench to unfasten the bolts which attached to the shell of the Nautilus. All is ready till tonight. The sea is bad. That I allow, but we must risk that. Liberty is worth paying for. Besides, the boat is strong. A few miles with a fair wind to carry us is no great thing. Who knows, but by tomorrow we may be a hundred leagues away. Let circumstances only favor us. And by ten or eleven o'clock, we shall have landed on some spot of terra firma, alive or dead. But adieu till, adieu now, till tonight. If you've missed previous episodes, I'm doing this French accent because I don't trust myself to do a Canadian accent without going full letter Kenny, and I don't think that fits here. With these words, the Canadian withdrew, leaving me almost dumb. I had imagined that, the chance gone, I should have time to reflect and discuss the matter. My obstinate companion had given me no time, and after all, what could I have said to him? Ned Land was perfectly right. There was almost the pro opportunity to profit by it. Could I retract my word, take upon myself the responsibility of compromising the future of my companions? Tomorrow, Captain Nemo might take us all far from land. At that moment, a rather loud hissing noise told me that the reservoirs were filling, and the Nautilus was sinking under the waves of the Atlantic. A sad day I passed between the desire of regaining my liberty of action and of abandoning, abandoning the wonder, wonderful Nautilus, and leaving my submarine studies incomplete. What dreadful hours passed thus! Sometimes seeing myself and companions safely landed, sometimes wishing, in spite of my reason, that some unforeseen circumstance would prevent the realization of Ned Land's project. Twice I went to the saloon. I wished to consult the compass. I wished to see if the direction the Nautilus was taking was bringing us nearer or taking us farther from the coast. But no, the Nautilus kept in these Portuguese waters. I must therefore take my part and prepare for flight. My luggage wasn't heavy, my notes nothing more. As to Captain Nemo, I asked myself what he would think of our escape what trouble, what wrong it might cause him, what he might do in case of its discovery or failure. Certainly I had no cause to complain of him. On the contrary, never was his hospitality freer. In leaving him, I could not be taxed with ingratitude. No oath bound us to him. It was on the strength of circumstances he relied, and not our word to fix us forever. I had not seen the captain since our visit to the island of Santorin. Would chance bring me to his presence before our departure? I wished it and I feared at the same time. I listened if I could hear him walking the room contiguous to mine. No sound reached my ear. I felt an unbearable uneasiness. This day of waiting seemed eternal. Hours struck too slowly to keep pace with my impatience. My dinner was served in my room as usual. I ate but little. I was too preoccupied. A hundred and twenty minutes, I counted them, still separated me from the moment in which I was to join Ned Land. My agitation redoubled, my pulse beat violently. I couldn't remain quiet. I went and came, hoping to calm my troubled spirit by constant movement. The idea of failure in our bold enterprise was the least painful of my anxieties. But the thought of seeing our project discovered before leaving the Nautilus, of being brought before Captain Nemo, irritated of what was worse saddened at my desertion, made my heart beat faster. I wanted to see the saloon for the last time. I descended the stairs and arrived in the museum, where I had passed so many useful and agreeable hours. I looked at all its riches, all its treasures, like a man on the eve of an eternal exile, who was leaving never to return. 
these wonders of nature, these masterpieces of art, amongst which so many days of my life had been concentrated, I was going to abandon them forever. I should like to have taken a last look through the windows of the saloon into the waters of the Atlantic, but the panels were hermetically closed, and a cloak of steel separated me from that ocean which I had not yet explored. In passing through the saloon, I came near the door which led into the angle which opened into the captain's room. To my great surprise, the door was ajar. I drew back involuntarily. If Captain Nemo should be in his room, he could see me, but hearing no sound, I drew nearer. The room was deserted. I pushed open the door took, and took some steps forward, still the same monk-like severity of aspect. Suddenly the clock struck eight. The first beat of the hammer on the bell awoke me from my dreaming. I trembled as if an invisible eye had plunged into my most secret thoughts, and I hurried from the room. There my eye fell upon the compass. Our course was still north, and the log indicated moderate speed the manometer a depth of about sixty feet. I returned to my room and clothed myself warmly. Sea boots, an otter skin cap, a great coat of byssus. Byssus? Lined with seal skin. I was ready, I was waiting. The vibration of the screw alone broke the deep silence which reigned on board. I listened attentively. Would no loud voice suddenly inform me that Ned Land had been surprised in his projected flight? A mortal dread hung over me and I vainly tried to regain my accustomed coolness. At a few minutes to nine, I put my ear to the captain's door, and heard no noise. I left my room and returned to the saloon, which was half in obscurity, but deserted. I opened the door, communicating with the library. The same insufficient light, the same solitude. I placed myself near the door leading to the central staircase, and there waited for Ned Land's signal. At that moment, the trembling of the screws sensibly diminished, and then stopped entirely. The silence was now only disturbed by the beatings of my own heart. Suddenly a slight shock was felt, and I knew that the Nautilus had stopped at the bottom of the ocean. My unease increased. The Canadian signal didn't come. I felt inclined to join Ned Land and beg of him to put off his attempt. I felt that we were not sailing under our usual conditions. At this moment, the door of the large saloon opened, and Captain Nemo appeared. He saw me, and without further preamble, began in an amiable tone of voice. Ah, uh, sir, I've been looking for you. Do you know the history of Spain? Now, one might know the history of one's own country by heart, but in the condition I was at the time, with troubled mind and head quite lost, I couldn't have said a word of it. Well, you heard my question. Do you know the history of Spain? S slightly. Well, here are learned men having to learn. Come, sit down. I'll tell you a curious episode in this history. Listen well, sir. This history will interest you on one side, for it will answer a question which doubtless you've not been able to solve. I listen, Captain, said I, not knowing what my interlocutor was driving at, and asking myself that this incident was bearing on our projected flight. Sir, if you have no objection, we'll go back to 1702. You cannot be ignorant that your king, Louis the Fourteenth, thinking that the gesture of a potentate was sufficient to bring the Pyrenees under his yoke, had imposed the Duke of Anjou, his grandson, on the Spaniards. This prince reigned more or less badly under the name of Philip V, and had a very strong party against him abroad. Indeed, the preceding year, the royal houses of Holland, Austria, and England had concluded a treaty of alliance at The Hague with the intention of plucking the crown of Spain from the head of Philip V and placing that on an archduke to whom they prematurely gave the title of Charles III. Spain resisted this coalition, but she was almost entirely unprovided with either soldiers or sailors. However, money wouldn't fail them, provided that their galleons, laden with gold and silver from America, entered their ports. And at the end of 1702 they expected a rich convoy which France was escorting the fleet of twenty-three vessels, commanded by Admiral Chateau Renault, for the ships of the coalition were already beating the Atlantic. This convoy was to go to Cadiz, but the Admiral, hearing that an English fleet was cruising in these waters, resolved to make for a French port. The Spanish commanders of the convoy objected to this decision. They wanted to be taken to a Spanish port, if not to Cadiz, then to Vigo Bay, situated on the northwest coast of Spain, which was not blocked. 
Admiral Chateau Renaud had the rashness to obey this injunction, and the galleons entered Vigo Bay. Unfortunately, it formed an open road which could not be defended in any way. They therefore must hasten to unload the galleons before the arrival of the combined fleet. Time would not have failed them, had a not a miserable question of rivalry suddenly arisen. I understand you, Fall. Perfectly, said I, not knowing the end proposed by this historical lesson. I'll continue. This is what passed. The merchants of Cadiz had a privilege by which they had the right of receiving all merchandise coming from the West Indies. Now, to disembark these ingots at the port of Vigo was depriving them of that right. They complained at Madrid and obtained the consent, the consent of the weak-minded Philip that the convoy, without discharging its cargo, should remain sequestered in the roads of Vigo until the enemy had disappeared. But whilst coming to this decision, on the 22nd of October, 1702, the English vessels arrived in Vigo Bay, when Admiral Chateau Renaud, in spite of inferior forces, fought, fra fought bravely. But seeing that the treasure must fall into the enemy's hands, he burnt and scuttled every gallon, galleon rather, which went to the bottom with their immense riches. Captain Nemo stopped. I admit I couldn't see yet why this, in why this history should be of interest to me. Well... Well, Monsieur Aronnax, we are in that Vigo Bay. Rest with yourself whether you'll penetrate its mysteries. The captain rose, telling me to follow him. I had had time to recover, and so I obeyed. The saloon was dark, but looking through the transparent glass, the waves were sparkling. For half a mile around the Nautilus, the water seemed bathed in electric light. The sandy bottom was clean and bright. Some of the ship's crew in their diving dresses were clearing away half-rotten barrels and empty cases from the midst of the blackened wrecks. From these cases and from these barrels escaped ingots of gold and silver, cascades of piastres and jewels. The sand was heaped up with them. Laden with their precious booty, the men returned to the Nautilus, disposed of their burden, and went back to this inexhaustible fishery of gold and silver. And I understood now. This was the scene of the battle on the 22nd of October, 1702. Here, on this very spot, the galleons, had laden for the, the galleons laden for the Spanish government had sunk. Here, Captain Nemo came, according to his wants, to pack up those millions with which he burdened the Nautilus. It was for him and him alone that America had given up her precious metals. He was the heir direct, without anyone to share, in those treasures torn from the Incas and from the conquered of Ferdinand Cortes. Did you know, sir, that the sea contained such riches? I knew that they held the money held in, that they value the money held in suspension in these waters at two million. Oh, doubtless, but to extract the money, the expense would be greater than the profits. Here, on the contrary, uh, I have yet to, I have but to pick up what man has lost, and not only in Vigo Bay, but a thousand other ports where shipwrecks have happened, and which are marked on my submarine map. Can you understand now the source of the millions I'm worth? I understand, Captain, but allow me to tell you that in exploring Vigo Bay, you've only been beforehand with a rival society. Which rival society? A society which has received from the Spanish government the privilege of seeking these buried galleons. The shareholders are led on by an allurement of an enormous bounty. They value these shipwrecks at five hundred millions. Five hundred millions they were, but not so much anymore. Just so, and a warning to those shareholders would be an act of charity. But who knows if it'd be well received? What gamblers usually regret of above, above all, less than the loss of their money, than of their foolish hopes. After all, I pity them less than to the thousands of unfortunates who, to whom so much riches well distributed would have been profitable, while for all them they'd be forever barren. I had no sooner expressed this regret than I felt that it must have wounded Captain Nemo. Where? Do you think then, sir, that these riches are lost because I gather them? Is it for myself alone, according to your idea, that I take the trouble to collect these treasures? Who told you I didn't make good use of it? You think I'm ignorant that there are suffering beings and oppressed races on this earth, miserable creatures to console, victims to avenge? Do you not understand? 
Captain Nemo stopped at these last words, regretting perhaps that he'd spoken so much. But I guess that whatever the motive had forced him to seek independence under the sea, it left him still a man. His heart still beat for the sufferings of humanity, that his immense charity was for oppressed races as well as for individuals. And then I understood for whom those millions were destined, which were forwarded by Captain Nemo when the Nautilus was cruising in the waters of Crete. So, in short, there, uh, Captain Nemo is like, Oh, uh, you guys stole all of the gold from America? Let me just, uh, let me just redistribute that Robin Hood style, since it's not your gold anyway. Okay, chapter 9, The Vanished Continent. The next morning, the 19th of February, I saw the Canadian enter my room. I expected this visit. He looked very disappointed. Well, sir, said he. Well, Ned, fortune was against us yesterday. Yes, that, that, that captain must need stop exactly at the hour we intended leaving his vessel. Yes, Ned, he had business at his bankers. His bankers? Rather, his banking house, that I mean the ocean. His riches are safer than in the chests of the state. I then related to the Canadian the incidents of the preceding night, hoping to bring him back to the idea of not abandoning the captain, but my recital had no other result than an energetically expressed regret from Ned that he had not been able to take a walk on the battlefield of Vigo on his own account. However, all is not ended. He's only a blow of the harpoon lost. Another time we must succeed, and tonight, if necessary. In what direction is the Nautilus going? I did not know. Well, at noon, we'll see, we shall see the point. The Canadian once again returned to Conseil. As soon as I was dressed, I went into the saloon. The compass wasn't reassuring. The course of the Nautilus was south-southwest. We were turning our backs on Europe. I waited with some impatience till the ship's place was pricked on the chart. At half past eleven, the reservoirs were emptied, and our vessel rose to the surface of the ocean. I rushed toward the platform, and Ned Land had preceded me. No more land in sight, nothing but an immense sea. Some sails on the horizon, doubtless those going to San Roque, in search of favorable winds for doubling the Cape of Good Hope. The weather was cloudy. A gale of wind was preparing. Ned raved and tried to pierce the cloudy horizon. He still hoped that behind all that fog stretched the land he so longed for. At noon, the sun itself showed for an instant. The second profited by this brightness to take its height. Then, the sea becoming more billowy, we descended, and the panel closed. An hour after, upon consulting the chart, I saw that the position of the Nautilus was marked at 16 degrees 17 minutes longitude and 33 degrees 22 minutes latitude, at a hundred and fifty leagues from the nearest coast. There was no means of flight, and I leave you to imagine the rage of the Canadian when I could inform him of, his, of our situation. For myself, I was not particularly sorry. I felt lightened of the load which had oppressed me, and was able to return with some degree of calmness to my accustomed work. That night, about eleven o'clock, I received a most unexpected visit from Captain Nemo. He asked me very graciously if I felt fatigued from my watch of the preceding night. I answered the negative. Then, Monsieur Aronnax, I propose a curious excursion. Propose, Captain? You have hitherto only visited the submarine depths by daylight, under the brightness of the sun. Would it suit you to see them in the darkness of the night? Most willingly. I'll warn you, the way will be tiring. We shall far to walk and must climb a mountain. The roads are not well kept. What you say, Captain, only heightens my curiosity. I'm ready to follow you. Come then, sir. We'll put on our diving dresses. Arrived at the robing room, I saw that neither my companions nor any of the ship's crew were to follow us on this excursion. Captain Nemo had not even proposed my taking with me either Ned or Conseil. In a few moments, we'd put on our diving dresses. They placed on our backs the reservoirs abundantly filled with air, but no electric lamps were prepared. 
I called the captain's attention to the fact. They'll be useless. I thought I'd not heard all right, but I couldn't repeat my observation, for the captain's head had already disappeared in its metal case. I finished harnessing myself. I felt them put an iron-pointed stick into my hand, and some minutes later, after going through the usual form, we set foot on the bottom of the Atlantic at a depth of a hundred and fifty fathoms. Midnight was near. The waters were profoundly dark, but Captain Nemo pointed out in the distance a reddish spot, a sort of large light shining brilliantly, about two miles from the Nautilus. What this fire might be, what could feed it, why and how it lit up the liquid mass, I couldn't say. In any case, it did light our way. Eh, vaguely, it's true, but I soon accustomed myself to the peculiar darkness, and I understood, under such circumstances, the uselessness of the Rumkorf apparatus. As we advanced, I heard a kind of pattering above my head. The noise redoubling, sometimes producing a continual shower, I soon understood the cause. It was rain falling, violently, and crisping the surface of the waves. Instinctively, the thought flashed across my mind that I should be wet through, by the water, in the midst of water. I couldn't help laughing at the odd idea. But indeed, in the thick diving dress, the liquid element is no longer felt. One only seems to be in an atmosphere somewhat denser than the terrestrial one. Nothing more. After half an hour's walk, the soil became stony. Medusae, microscopic cr crustacea, and penatules lit it slightly with their phosphorescent gleam. I caught a glimpse of pieces of stone covered with millions of zoophytes and masses of seaweed. My feet often slipped upon this sticky carpet of seaweed, and without my iron-tipped stick I should have fallen more than once. In turning round I could still see the whitest lantern of the Nautilus beginning to pale in the distance. But the rosy light which guided us increased and lit up the horizon. The presence of this fire under water puzzled me in the highest degree. Was I going toward a natural phenomenon as yet unknown to the savants of the earth? Or even, for this thought crossed my brain, had the hand of man ought to do with this conflagration? Had he fanned this flame? Was I going to meet in these depths companions and friends of Captain Nemo, whom he was going to visit, and who, like him, led this strange existence? Shall I find down there a whole colony of exiles who, weary of the miseries of this earth, had sought and found independence in the deep ocean. All these foolish and unreasonable ideas pursued me, and in this condition of mind, overexcited by the succession of wonders continually passing before my eyes, I should not have been surprised to meet at the bottom of the sea one of those submarine towns of which Captain Nemo dreamed. Our road, our road grew lighter and lighter. The white glimmer came in rays from the summit of a mountain about eight hundred feet high but what I saw was simply a reflection developed by the clearness of the waters. The source of this inexplicable light was a fire on the opposite side of the mountain. In the midst of this stony maze furrowing the bottom of the Atlantic, Captain Nemo advanced without hesitation. He knew this dreary road. Doubtless he'd often traveled over it and couldn't lose himself. I followed him with an unshaken confidence. He seemed to me like a genie of the sea, and as he walked before me, I could not help in admiring his stature, which was outlined in black on the luminous horizon. It was one in the morning when we arrived at the first slopes of the mountain, but to gain access to them we must venture through the difficult paths, difficult paths of a vast copse. Yes, the copse of dead trees, without leaves, without sap, trees petrified by the action of the water, and here and there overtopped by gigantic pines. It was like a coal pit still standing holding by the roots to the broken soil, and whose branches, like fine black paper cuttings, showed distinctly on the watery ceiling. Picture, your, picture to yourself a forest in the hearts, hanging on to the sides of the mountain, but a forest swallowed up. The paths were encumbered with seaweed and fucus, which, between which groveled a whole world of crustacean. I went along, climbing the rocks, striding over extended trunks, breaking the sea bindweed which hung Oh, excuse me. Uh, which hung from one tree to another, and frightening the fishes which flew from branch to branch. Pressing onward, I felt no fatigue. I followed my guide, who had never tired. What a spectacle! How can I express it? How paint the aspect of those words and rocks in this medium? 
their underparts dark and wild, the upper colored with red tints. By that light which the reflecting powers of the waters doubled, we climbed rocks which fell directly after with gigantic bounds and the low growling of an avalanche. To right and left ran long, dark galleries where sight was lost. Here opened vast blades which the hand of man seemed to have worked, and I sometimes asked myself if some inhabitant of these submarine regions would not suddenly appear to me. But Captain Nemo was still mounting. I could not stay behind. I followed boldly. My stick gave me good help. False help. A false step would have been dangerous on the narrow passage, sloping down to the sides of the gulfs. But I walked with firm step, without feeling any giddiness. Now I jumped a crevice, the depth of which would have been made, which would have made me hesitate had it been among the glaciers on the land. Now I ventured on to the unsteady trunk of a tree, thrown across from one abyss to the other, without looking under my feet, having only eyes to admire the wild sights of this region. There, monumental rocks, leaning on their regularly cut bases, seemed to defy all laws of equilibrium. From between their stony from between their stony knees trees sprang like a jet under heavy pressure and upheld others which upheld them natural towers large scarps cut perpendicularly like a curtain inclined at an angle which the laws of gravitation could never have tolerated in terrestrial regions two hours after quitting the nautilus we had crossed the line of trees and a hundred feet above our heads rose the top of the mountain which cast a shadow on the brilliant irradiation of the opposite slope some petrified shrubs ran fantastically here and there. Fishes got up under our feet like birds in the long grass. The massive rocks were rent with impenetrable fractures, deep grottos and unfathomable holes, at the bottom of which formidable creatures might have been heard moving. My blood curdled when I saw enormous antennae blocking my road, or some frightful claw closing with a noise in the shadow of some cavity. Millions of luminous spots shone brightly in the midst of the darkness. They were the eyes of giant crustacea crouched in their holes, giant lobsters setting themselves up like ha halber halberdiers, setting themselves up like halberdiers, and moving their claws with a clicking sound of pinchers, titanic crabs pointed like a gun on its carriage, and a frightful looking polyp, interweaving their tentacles like a living nest of serpents. We had now arrived on the first platform where other surprises awaited me. Before us lay some picturesque ruins which betrayed the hand of man, and not that of the Creator. There were vast heaps of stone, amongst which might be traced the vague and shadowy forms of castles and temples, clothed within a world of blossoming zoophytes, and over which, instead of ivy, seaweed and fucus threw a thick vegetable mantle. But what was this portion of the globe which had been swallowed by cataclysms? Who had placed these rocks and stones like cromlechs of prehistoric times? Where was I? Whither had Captain Nemo's fancy hurried me? I would fain have asked him, not being able to, so I stopped him. I seized his arm, but he shook his head and pointed to the highest point of the mountain, seeming to say, Come on, come along, come higher. I followed, and in a few minutes I had climbed to the top, for which a circle of ten yards commanded the whole mass of rock. I looked down the side we had just climbed. The mountain did not rise of more than seven or eight hundred feet above the level of the plain, but on the opposite side it commanded, from twice that height, the depths of this part of the Atlantic. My eyes ranged far over a large space lit by a violent fulguration. In fact, the mountain was a volcano. At fifty feet above the peak, in the midst of a rain of stones and scoriae, a large crater was vomiting forth torrents of lava, which fell in a cascade of fire into the bosom of the liquid mass. Thus situated, this volcano lit the lower plain like an immense torch, even to the extreme limits of the horizon. I said that the submarine crater threw up lava, but no flames. Flames, of course, require oxygen of the air to feed upon, and cannot be developed under water, but streams of lava, having in themselves the principle of their incandescence, can attain a white heat, fight vigorously, against the liquid element, and turn it to vapor by contact. Rapid currents bearing all these gases in diffusion and torrents of lava slid to the bottom of the mountain, like an eruption of Vesuvius on another Terra del Greco. Terra del Greco. Terra del Greco, rather. There, indeed, under my eyes, ruined, destroyed, lay a town, 
its roofs open to the sky, its temples fallen, its arches dislocated, its columns lying on the ground, from which one would still recognize the massive character of some Tuscan architecture. Further on, remains of a gigantic aqueduct, here the high base of an Acropolis, with the floating outline of a Parthenon. There are traces of a quay, as if an ancient port had formerly been abutted on the borders of the ocean, and disappeared with its merchant vessels and its war galleys. Farther on again, long lines of sunken walls and broad, deserted streets, a perfect Pompeii escaped beneath the water. Such was the sight that Captain Nemo brought before my eyes. Where was I? Where was I? I must know at any cost. I tried to speak, but Captain Nemo stopped me by a gesture, and picking up a piece of chalk stone, advanced to a rock of black basalt, and traced the one word, Atlantis. What a light shot through my mind. Atlantis, the Atlantis of Plato, that continent denied by Oregon and Humboldt, who placed its disappearance among the legendary tales. I had it there now, before my eyes, bearing upon it the unexceptionable testimony of its catastrophe. The region thus engulfed was beyond Europe, Asia, and Libya, beyond the columns of Hercules, where those powerful people, the Atlantides, the Atlantides lived, against whom the first wars of ancient Greece were waged. Thus, by led, thus led by the strangest destiny, I was treading underfoot the mountains of this continent, touching with my hand those ruins a thousand generations old and contemporary with geological epochs. I was walking on the very spot where the contemporaries of the first man had walked. Whilst I was trying to fix in my mind every detail of this grand landscape, Captain Nemo remained motionless, as if petrified in mute ecstasy leaning on a mossy stone. Was he dreaming of those generations long since disappeared? Was he asking them the secret of human destiny? Was he here, in this strange man, that he came to steep himself in historical recollection, live again this ancient life, he who wanted no modern one? What would I not have given to know in his thoughts, to share them, to understand? We remained for an hour at this place, contemplating the vast plains, under the brightness of the lava, which was sometimes wonderfully intense. A rapid trembling ran along the mountain, caused by internal bubblings. Deep noise, distinctly transmitted through the liquid medium, were echoed with majestic grandeur. At this moment, the moon appeared through the mass of waters and threw her pale rays on the buried continent. It was but a gleam, but what an indescribable effect! The captain rose cast one last look on the immense plain, and then bade me follow him. We descended the mountain, rapidly, and the mineral forest once passed, I saw the lantern of the Nautilus shining like a star. The captain walked straight to it, and we got on board as the first rays of light whitened the surface of the ocean. <sighs> what a find! Isn't that wild? Literally, just literally... Inhabiting Atlantis. No matter how many times I read this book, that particular chapter sneaks up on me. I'm like, every time I'm like, what is it? What is here? Is this is this going to be like, you know, the, the main character kind of speculates like, is this a whole underground city of people like Nemo? And then, nope, it is an, it is an undersea city like you were expecting, but it's an abandoned one. It's Atlantis. <laughs> I remember several other details from this book quite clearly. You know, like the the duel they had with the Nautilus at the opening, and the duel they had with the Dugong relatively recently, and the, the tunnel between uh, the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, and uh, some stuff that happens later that actually lends the book its title. That's probably why I remember it. But I always forget about Atlantis being there. Which is kind of fitting, to be fair. Anyway, let's dive into Chapter 10, The Submarine Coal Mines. The next day, the 20th of February, I awoke very late. The fatigues of the previous night had prolonged my sleep until 11 o'clock. I dressed quickly and hastened to find the course the Nautilus was taking. The instrument showed it to be still toward the south, 
with a speed of 20 miles an hour and a depth of 50 fathoms. The species of fish here did not differ much from those already noticed. There were rays of giant size, five yards long and endowed with great muscular strength, which enabled them to shoot above the waves. Sharks of many kinds, amongst others, one 15 feet long with triangular sharp teeth, and whose transparency rendered it almost invisible in the water. Amongst bony fish, Conseil noticed some about three yards long, armed at the upper jaw with a piercing sword. Other bright-colored creatures, known in the time of Aristotle by the name of the Sea Dragon, which are dangerous to capture on account of the spikes on their back. About four o'clock, the soil, generally composed of a thick mud mixed with petrified wood changed by degrees, became more stony, seemed strewn with conglomerate and pieces of basalt with a sprinkling of lava. I thought that a mountainous region was succeeding the long plains, and accordingly, after a few evolutions of the Nautilus, I saw a southerly horizon blocked by a high wall which seemed to close all exit. Its summit evidently passed the level of the ocean. It must be a continent, or at least an island, one of the Canaries or of the Cape Verde Islands. The bearings not yet being taken, perhaps designedly, I was ignorant of our exact position. In any case, such a wall seemed to me to mark the limits of that Atlantis, of which we had in reality passed over the only the smallest part. Much longer should I have remained at the window, admiring the beauties of sea and sky, but the panels closed. At this moment, the Nautilus arrived at the side of this high, perpendicular wall. What it would do, I could not guess. I returned to my room. It no longer moved. I laid myself down with the full intention of waking after a few hours' sleep, but it was eight o'clock the next day when I entered the saloon. I looked at the manometer. It told me that the Nautilus was floating on the surface of the ocean. And beside, I heard steps on the platform. I went to the panel. It was open, but instead of broad daylight as I expected, I was surrounded by profound darkness. Where were we? Was I mistaken? Is it still night? No, not a star was not a star was shining, and night had it not that other utter darkness. I knew not what to think when a voice near me said, "Is that you, Professor?" Uh, uh, Captain, where are we? Underground, sir. Uh, underground and the Nautilus floating still? Oh, it always floats. I don't understand. Wait a few minutes. We'll light our lantern, and if you like light places, you'll be satisfied. I stood on the platform and waited. The darkness was so complete that I couldn't even see Captain Nemo, but looking to the zenith, exactly above my head, I seemed to catch an undecided gleam, a kind of twilight filling a circular hole. At this instant, the lantern was lit and its vividness dispelled the faint light. I closed my dazzled eyes for an instant and then looked again. The Nautilus was stationary, floating near a mountain which formed a sort of quay. The lake, then, supporting it, was a lake imprisoned by a circle of walls, measuring two miles in diameter and six in circumference. Its level, the manometer showed, could only be the same as the outside level, for there must necessarily be a communication between the lake and the sea. The high partitions, leaning forward on their base, grew into a vaulted roof bearing the shape of an immense funnel turned upside down, the height, of, the height being about five or six hundred yards. The summit was a circular orifice by which I had caught the slightest gleam of light that was evidently daily. Where are we? In the very heart of an extinct volcano, the interior of which has been invaded by the sea after some great convulsion of the earth. Whilst you were sleeping, Professor, the Nautilus penetrated this lagoon by a natural canal, which opens about ten yards beneath the surface of the ocean. This is its harbor of refuge, a sure, commodious, and mysterious one, sheltered from all gales. Show me, if you can, on the coasts of any of your continents or islands, a road which can give perfect refuge from all those storms. Certainly you are in safety here, Captain Nemo, who could reach you in the heart of a volcano, but... Did I not see an opening in the summit? Yes, its crater, formerly filled with lava, vapor, and flames, which now gives entrance to the life-giving air we breathe. What is this volcanic mountain? It belongs to one of the numerous islands with which this sea is strewn. To vessels a simple sandbank, to us an immense cavern. Chance led me to discover it, and chance served me well. Of what use is this refuge, Captain? The Nautilus wants no port. 
No, sir, but it wants electricity to make it move, and the wherewithal to make the electricity. Feed it, sodium to feed the elements, coal from which to get the sodium, and a coal mine to supply the coal. And exactly on this spot, the sea covers entire forests embedded during the geological periods, now mineralized and transformed into coal. For me, they're an inexhaustible mine. You're made fun with the trade of miners here, Captain? Exactly so. These mines extend under the waves like the mines of Newcastle. Here in their diving dresses, pickaxe and shovel in hand, my men extract the coal, from which I do not even ask from the mines of the earth. When I burn this combustible for the manufacture of sodium, the smoke, escaping from the crater of the mountain, gives it the appearance of a still active volcano. Shall we see your companions at work? No, not this time at least. For I'm in a hurry to continue our submarine tour of the earth. Shall I, so I shall content myself with drawing from the reserve of sodium I already possess. The time for loading is one day only. We continue our voyage. So if you wish to go over the cavern and make the round of the lagoon, you must take advantage of today, Monsieur Arnaud. I thanked the captain and went to look for my companions, who had not yet left their cabin. I invited them to follow me without saying where we were. They mounted at the platform. Conseil, who was astonished at nothing, seemed to look upon it as quite natural that he should wake under a mountain after having fallen asleep under the waves, but Ned Land had thought of nothing but finding whether the cavern had any exit. After breakfast, about ten o'clock, we went down to the mountain. Here we are once more on land. I do not call it this land, and besides, when all done, it would be easy. Between the walls of the mountains and the waters of the lake lay a sandy shore which had its greatest breadth measured five hundred feet. On this soil one might easily make the tour of the lake. But the base of the high partitions was stony ground, with the volcanic locks and enormous pumice stones lying in picturesque heaps. All these detached masses, covered with enamel, polished by the action of the subterraneous fires, shone resplendent by the light of our electric lantern. The mica dust from the shore rising under our feet flew like a cloud of sparks. The bottom now rose sensibly, and we soon arrived at long circuitous slopes, or inclined plains, which took us higher by degrees. Though we were obliged to walk carefully among these conglomerates, they were bound by no cement, the feet slipping on the grassy, glassy crystal, feldspar, and quartz. The volcanic nature of this enormous excavation was confirmed on all sides, and I pointed it out to my companion. Picture to yourselves what this crater must have been when filled with boiling lava, when the level of the incandescent liquid rose to the orifice of the mountain, as though melted on the top of a hot plate. I can picture it perfectly, but, sir, will you tell me why the great architect has suspended operations? How it is that the furnace is replaced by the quiet waters of the lake? Well, most probably, Conseil, some convulsion beneath the ocean produced the very opening which served as a passage for the Nautilus. The waters of the Atlantic rushed into the interior of the mountain. A terrible struggle between two elements ensued, a struggle which ended in the victory of Neptune. But many ages have run out since then. The submerged volcano is now a peaceable grotto. Very well, I accept your explanation, sir. But in our own interests, I regret that the opening of which you speak was not made above the level of the sea. But... But, friend Ned, if the passage had not been under the sea, passage had not been under the sea, the Nautilus could not have gone through it. We continued ascending. The steps became more and more perpendicular and narrow. Deep excavations, which we were obliged to cross, cut them here and there. Sloping masses had to be turned. We slid upon our knees and crawled along. But Conseil's dexterity and the Canadian strength surmounted all the obstacles. At a height of about thirty-one feet, the nature of the ground changed without becoming more practical. The conglomerate and trachyte tra succeeded black basalt. The first dispread in layers full of bubbles, the latter forming regular prisms placed like a colonnade, supporting the spring of the immense vault. An admirable specimen of natural architecture. Between the, locks of, between the blocks of basalt were wound long streams of lava, long since grown cold, encrusted with bituminous rays, and in some places there were spread large carpets of sulfur. 
A more powerful light shone through the upper crater, shedding a vague glimmer over these volcanic depressions forever to pair forever buried in the bosom of this extinguished mountain. But our upward march was soon stopped at a height of about 250 feet by impassable obstacles. There was a complete vaulted arch overhanging us, and our ascent was changed to a circular walk. At the last change, vegetable life began to struggle with the mineral. Some shrubs and even some trees grew from the fractures of the walls. I recognized some euphorbias with a caustic sugar coming from them. Heliotropes, quite incapable of justifying their names, sadly drooped their clusters of flowers, both their color and perfume half gone. Here and there, there's some chrysanthemums grew timidly at the foot of an aloe with long, sickly-looking leaves. But between the streams of lava, I saw some little violets still slightly perfumed, and I admit that I smelt them with delight. Perfume is the soul of the flower, and sea flowers have no soul. We'd arrived at the foot of some sturdy dragon trees, which pushed aside the rocks with their strong roots when Ned Land exclaimed, Sir, I, sir, I hive, I hive. A hive? I replied with a gesture of incredulity. Yes, a hive, and bees humming around it. I approached and was bound to believe my own eyes. There, there at a hole bored in one of the dragon trees, were some thousands of these ingenious insects, so common in all the canaries, and whose produce is so much esteemed. Naturally enough, the Canadian wished to gather the honey, and I couldn't well oppose his wish. A quantity of dry leaves, mixed with sulfur, he lit with a spark from his flint and began to smoke out the bees. The humming ceased by degrees, and the hive eventually yielded several pounds of the sweetest honey, with which Ned Land filled his haversack. When I have mixed this honey with the paste of the breadfruit, I shall be able to offer you a succulent cake. Transcriber noting that... Oh, there's a transcriber's note. Uh, the breadfruit has been substituted for artocarpus in this edition. Thank you, transcriber. Very good. Upon my word, it will be gingerbread. Never mind the gingerbread. Let's continue our interesting walk. At every turn of the path that we were following, the lake appeared in all its length and breadth. The lantern lit up the whole of its peaceable surface, which knew neither ripple nor wave. The Nautilus remained perfectly immovable. On the platform and on the mountain, the ship's crew were working like black shadows clearly carved against the luminous atmosphere. We were now going round the highest crest of the first layers of rock which upheld the roof. I then saw that bees were not the only representatives of the animal kingdom in this interior of the volcano. Birds of prey hovered here and there in the shadows or fled from their nests on top of the rocks. There were sparrow hawks with white with white chest, and kestrels and down slopes scampered with their long legs several fine fat fat bustards. I almost misread, misread that one. Oops. <laughs> I'd leave anyone to imagine the covetousness of the Canadian, the sight of this savory game, and whether he did not regret having any gun. But he did his best to replace the lead by stones, and after several fruitless attempts, succeed, succeeded in wounding a magnificent bird. To say that he risked his life twenty times before reaching it is but the truth. But he managed so well that the creature joined the honey cakes in his bag. We were now obliged to descend toward the shore, the crest becoming impracticable. Above us the crater seemed to gape like the mouth of a well. From this place the sky could be clearly seen, and the clouds dissipated by the west wind, leaving behind them, even on the summit of the mountain, their misty remnants, certain proof that they were only moderately high for the volcano did not rise more than 800 feet above the level of the ocean. Half an hour after the Canadian's last exploit, we regained the inner shore. Here the flora was represented by large carpets of marine crystal, a little um, um, umbelliferous. I assume that's a very, like, it's got a little hat type thing. A little umbelliferous. Uh, I keep wanting to say umbelliferous, but there's no R there. A little umbelliferous plant, very good to pickle, which always, which also bears the name of pierce stone and sea fen. Okay, I'm looking this one up because I ha I've been resisting the urge to look up some of these things. Sea fennel. Oh, it is a little. Uh, 
It's got a little, it's got a little hat. There's a little, it's a bunch of little green shoots, and then it has a little dome shape. Well, that's actually really cute. No wonder they call it sea fennel, though. That looks, <laughs> that looks like a fennel plant. Uh, where were we? Conseil gathered some bundles. As to the fauna, it might be, as to the fauna, it might be, it, it might be counted by thousands of crustacea of all sorts. Lobsters, crabs, spider crab, chameleon shrimp, a large number of shells, rockfish, and limpets. Three quarters of an hour later, we'd finished our circuitous walk and were on board the Nautilus once more. The crew had just finished loading the sodium, and the Nautilus could have left that instant, but Captain Nemo gave no such order. Did he wish to wait until night and leave the submarine passage secretly? Perhaps so. Whatever it might be, the next day, the Nautilus, having left its port, steered clear of all land at a few yards beneath the waves of the Atlantic. Isn't that wild? <laughs> Go from Atlantis to, like, some journey to the center of the Earth type stuff with, an, with a hollow volcano. Journey to the center of the Earth was also Jules Verne, wasn't it? Was that written before this book or after this book? That, I believe, is a Google question, and I may look it up over the intermission, which we're going to have eventually, here. Um, I may, I, I, I will eventually get around a journey to the center, journey to the center of the earth, by the way. Uh, no promises if or when, unless someone makes a specific request. But I do plan on eventually getting around to it. It is, uh, I believe it's public domain. It should be public domain. I mean, it was written by Jules Verne, and, you know, he is contemporary to himself, so you'd think it'd be public domain. I will get eventually around to 20,000, uh, not 20,000 leagues, a uh, journey to the center of the earth. Uh, but I actually, it's been a long time if I've, if I since I've read the journey to the center of the earth to be honest mostly what I remember when I'm thinking of journey of this journey to the center of the earth is uh the I assume it was 2000s adaptation with the kid from um Sethura and um what else did he do? Bridge to Terabithia, and uh, God, there's one more huge one that I'm forgetting. But uh, was he one of the kids in uh, in Shark Boy and Lava Girl? I can't remember. But you you probably know who I mean in mentioning Zathura and Bridge to Terabithia. He was a very popular child actor at the time, and he was also in an adaptation of uh, of Journey to the Center of the Earth. I believe it, that one also had Nick Cage, maybe? Probably? Potentially? Uh, but we'll talk more about Journey to the Center of the Earth as a film, as a series of seemingly endless films when we're actually reading Journey to the Center of the Earth. Dang it. Like I was mentioning the other day, I'm kind of surprised nobody's taken on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea other than, like, Disney, but I I almost wonder if it's like, if it's just kind of considered unremarkable now, like submarines are kind of commonplace these days. So, you know, there might not be much reason to adapt it unless you're adapting it straight. <laughs> you know, if you're being, if you're being like, oh yeah, this is set in the, this is set in the 1800s, check out this cool brass submarine. I don't know, and it might be one of those things where like, it's been getting adaptations, and I just haven't been hearing about hearing about them. You know, the, uh, that happened with Invisible Man. Apparently, like they, uh, I was poking around on some wikis after I had finished up Invisible Man. Like, how has nobody done this? It's a, it's such an effects vehicle. Um, there was a modern take on Invisible Man released like a couple months into the, uh, into. 2020 i think and it was originally planned to be part of the whole like 
Universal Monsters Connected Universe thing, but then the Mummy remake flopped super hard, and so they were like, no, this is definitely just a standalone movie. This is fine. They had to, like, completely... <laughs> they clearly had to, like, change the script very aggressively. Personally, I think if they were led with something other than the Mummy, uh, they could have gotten away with Universal Monsters Connected Universe. Especially if they led with, like... Frankenstein, or, uh, what's another, uh, ooh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. Creature from the Black Lagoon has not had a, a take in a long time. Heck, they could have even gotten away with Dracula. I know, I know vampires in the popular consciousness are kind of, like, tired because of the, because of the 2000s and the early 2010s, but, like, they could have gotten away with Dracula. They absolutely could have gotten away with Dracula. Just starting with The Mummy, which was like the most beloved take on a universal monster in recent memory, was a very bad choice, especially making it a Tom Cruise vehicle after The Mummy and The Mummy Returns were so, so good. Sorry, we're straying pretty heavily into film critique here. And well, I would love to do uh, some public domain movie nights sometime on stream. That's not on topic. So let's get back on topic, shall we? And dive into chapter 11, the Sargasso Sea. That day, the Nautilus crossed the singular part of the Atlantic Ocean. No one can be ignorant of the existence of a current of warm water known by the name of the Gulf Stream. After leaving the Gulf of Florida, we went in the directions of Spitzberg. But before entering the Gulf of Mexico, about 45 degrees of north latitude, this current divides into two arms. The principal one going toward the coast of Ireland and Norway. Excuse me, sorry. Uh, uh, this card divides into two arms, the principal one going toward the coast of Ireland and Norway, whilst the second bends to the south, about the height of the Azores. Azores, rather. Then, touching the African shore and describing a lengthened oval, returns to the Antilles. This second arm, it's rather a collar than an arm, surrounds with its circles of warm water that portion of the cold, quiet, immovable ocean called the Sargasso Sea, a perfect lake in the open Atlantic. It takes no less than three years for the great current to pass around it. Such was the region, region the Nautilus was now visiting, a perfect meadow, a close carpet of seaweed, focus, and tropical berries, so thick and so compact that the stem of a vessel could hardly tear its way through it. And Captain Nemo, not wishing to entangle his screw in this herbaceous mass, kept some yard below the surface of the waves. The name Sargasso came comes from the Spanish word comes from the Spanish word Sargasso, which signifies kelp. This kelp or berry plant is the principal formation of this immense bank, and this is the reason why these plants unite in the peaceful basin of the Atlantic. The only explanation which can be given, he says, seems to be to result from the experience known to all the world. Place in a vase some fragments of cork or other floating body and give to the water in the vase, a circular movement. The scattered fragments will unite in a group in the center of the liquid surface, that is to say, in the part least agitated. In the phenomenon we are considering, the Atlantic is the vase, the Gulf, the Gulf Stream, that circular current, and the Sargasso Sea, the central point at which the floating bodies unite. I share Maori's opinion, and I was able to study the phenomenon in the very midst where the vessels rarely penetrate. Above us floated products of all kinds, heaped up amongst the brownish plants, trunks of trees torn from the Andes or the Rocky Mountains, floated by the Amazon and the Mississippi, numerous wrecks, remains of keels or ships' bottoms, side planks, stove in, and so weighted with shells and barnacles, they could not again rise to the surface. And time will one day justify Maori's other opinion, that these substances thus accumulated for ages will become petrified, by the action of the water, and will then form inexhaustible coal mines, a precious reserve prepared by far-seeing nature 
for the moment when men shall have exhausted the minds of continents. In the midst of this inextricable mass of plants and seaweed, I noticed some charming pink halcyons and actinia, their long tentacles trailing after them, and medusae red, red, green, and blue. All the day of the 22nd of February, we passed in the Sargasso Sea, where such fish are as partial to marine plants find abundant nourishment. The next, the ocean had returned to its accustomed aspect. From this time, for nineteen days, from the 23rd of February to the 12th of March, the Nautilus kept in the middle of the Atlantic, carrying us at a constant speed of a hundred leagues in twenty-four hours. Captain Nemo evidently intended accomplishing his submarine program, and I imagine that he intended, after doubling Cape Horn, to return to the Australian seas of the Pacific. Ned Land had cause for fear. In these large seas void of islands, we couldn't attempt to leave the boat, nor had we any means of opposing Captain Nemo's will. Our only course, our only course, our only course was to submit, but what we could neither gain nor fo gain by force nor cunning. I like to think that it might be obtained by persuasion. This voyage ended, would he not consent to restore our liberty, under an oath never to reveal his existence, an oath of honor which we'd religiously keep? But we must consider that delicate question with the captain. Was I free to claim this liberty? Had he not himself said from the beginning in the firmest manner that the secret of his life exacted from him our lasting imprisonment on board the Nautilus? Would not my four months' silence appear to him a tacit acceptance of our situation? Would not a return to the subject result in raising suspicions which might be hurtful to our projects if at some future time a favorable opportunity offered to return to them? During the nineteen days mentioned above, no incident of any kind happened to signalize our voyage. I saw little of the captain. He was at work. In the library I often found his books left open, especially those on natural history. My work on submarine depth conned over by him was covered with marginal notes, often contradicting, often contradicting my theories and systems, but the captain contented himself with thus purging my work. It was very rare for him to discuss it. Sometimes I heard the melancholy tones of his organ, but only at night, in the midst of the deepest obscurity when the Nautilus slept upon the deserted ocean. During this part of the voyage, we sailed whole days on the surface of the waves. The sea seemed abandoned. A few sailing vessels on the road to India were making for the Cape of Good Hope. One day we were followed by the boats of a whaler, who no doubt took us for some enormous whale of great price. But Captain Nemo did not wish the worthy fellows to lose their time and trouble, and so ended the chase by plunging under water. Our navigation continued until the 13th of March. That day the Nautilus was employed in taking soundings, which greatly interested me. We had then made about 13,000 leagues since our departure from the high seas of the Pacific. The bearings gave us 45 degrees 37 minutes south latitude and 37 degrees 35 minutes west longitude. It was the same water in which Captain Denham of the Herald sounded 7,000 fathoms without finding the bottom. There, too, Lieutenant Parker of the American Frigate Congress could not touch the bottom with 15,140 fathoms. Captain Nemo intended seeking at the bottom of the ocean even by a di diagonal sufficiently lengthened by means of lateral planes placed at an angle of 45 degrees with the waterline of the Nautilus. Then the screw set to work at its maximum speed, its four blades beating the waves with indescribable force. Under this powerful pressure, the hull of the Nautilus quivered like a sonorous cord and sank regularly under the water. At 7,000 fathoms, I saw some blackish tops rising from the midst of the waters, but these summits might belong to high mountains like Himalayas or Mont Blanc, even higher, and the depth of the abyss remained incalculable. The Nautilus descended still lower, in spite of the great pressure. I felt the steel, bait, the steel plates tremble at the fastening of the bolts. Its bars bent, its partitions groan, the windows of the saloon seemed to curve under the pressure of the waters. And this firm structure would doubtless have yielded if, as its captain had said, it had not been capable of resistance like a solid block. We had attained a depth of 16,000 yards, four leagues, 
and the sides of the Nautilus then bore a pressure of 1,600 atmospheres, that is to say 3,200 pounds, to each square two-fifths of an inch of its surface. What a situation to be in, to overrun these deep regions where man has never trod. Look, Captain, look at these magnificent rocks. These uninhabited grottos, these lowest receptacles of the globe, where life is no longer possible. I mean, what unknown sights are here? Sorry, I need to make sure that wasn't a problem occurring. Uh, where life is no longer possible, what unknown sights are here? Why should we be unable to preserve a remembrance of them? Would you like to carry more, away more than a remembrance? What do you mean by these words? I mean that nothing's easier than to make a phot photographic view of this submarine region. I had not time to express my surprise at this new proposition when, at Captain Nemo's call, an objective was brought into the saloon. Through the widely opened panel, the liquid mass was bright with electricity, which was distributed with such uniformity that not a shadow, not a gradation, was to be seen in our manufactured light. The Nautilus remained motionless, the force of its screw subdued by the inclination of its planes. The instrument was propped on the bottom of the oceanic site, and in a few seconds we'd obtained a perfect negative. But the operation being over, Captain Nemo said, Let us go up. We must not abuse our position nor expose the Nautilus too long to such great pressure. Go up again? Hold well on. I had not time to understand why the captain cautioned me thus when I was thrown forward onto the carpet. At a signal from the captain, the screw was shipped and its blades raised vertically. The Nautilus shot into the air like a balloon, rising with stunning rapidity and cutting the mass of the waters with a sonorous agitation. Nothing was visible and in four minutes it had shot through the four leagues which separated it from the ocean, and after emerging like a flying fish, fell, making the waves rebound to an enormous height. Okay, folks, one more chapter, and then we will be... we will be doing uh, an intermission, but... First... <laughs> first, let's dive into chapter 12, shall we? Chapter 12, Cachalots and Whales. I just noticed. Sorry, I noticed one of the heaters had turned off, and that's not exactly a tenable situation to be in, in this weather. Where was I, huh? Cachalots and Whales. During the nights of the 13th and 14th of March, the Nautilus returned to its southerly course. I fancied that when on level with Cape Horn, he would turn the helm westward in order to beat the Pacific Seas and so complete the tour of the world. He did nothing of the kind, but continued on his way to the southern regions. Where was he going to? To the Pole? It was madness! I began to think that the captain's tem temerity justified Ned Land's fears. For some time past, the Canadian had not spoken to me of his projects of flight. He was less communicative, almost silent. I could see that this lengthened imprisonment was weighing on him, and I felt that rage was burning within him. When he met the captain, his eyes lit up with suppressed anger, and I feared that his natural violence would lead him to some extreme. That day, the 14th of March, Conseil and he came to me in my room. I inquired the cause of their visit. A simple question to ask you, sir. Speak, Ned. How many men on the, are there on the board of the Nautilus, do you think? I cannot tell, my friend. I should say that it's working, does not require a large screw. Certainly, under existing conditions, ten men at the most ought to be enough. Then why should there be any more? Why? I replied, looking fixedly at Ned Land, whose meaning was easy to guess. Because, if my surmises are correct, if I've well understood the captain's existence, the Nautilus isn't only a vessel, it's also a place of refuge for those who, like its commander, have broken every tie upon her. Perhaps so, but in any case, the Nautilus can only contain a certain number of men. Could you not, could not you, sir, estimate their maximum? How could they? By calculation. 
given the size of the vessel, which you know, sir, and consequently the quantity of air it contains, knowing how much each man expends at a breath, comparing these results with the fact that the Nautilus is obliged to go to the surface every 24 hours. Conseil had not finished the sentence before I saw what he was driving. I understand, but that calculation, simple enough, can give a pretty uncertain result. Never mind. Here it is, then. Uh, in one hour, each man consumes an oxygen contained in 20 gallons of air. In 24, that contained in 480 gallons. We must, therefore, find how many times 480 gallons of air the Nautilus contains, no? Just so. Or, the size of the Nautilus being 1,500 tons, one ton, one ton holding 200 gallons, it contains 300,000 gallons of air, let's say. Which, divided by 480, gives a quotient of 625. Which means to say, strictly speaking, the air contained in the Nautilus would suffice for 625 men for an entire day. 625? But remember, all of us, passengers, sailors, officers included, would not form a tenth part of that number. There's still too many for three men. The Canadian shook his head, passed his hand across his forehead, and left the room without answering. Hi, Rose. Happy to see you here. Will you allow me to make one observation, sir? Hornet is lo longing for everything he cannot have. His past life is always present to him. Everything that we are forbidden he regrets. His head is full of old recollections. And we must understand him. What, what has he to do here? Nothing. He's not learned like you, sir. He has not the same taste for the beauties of the sea that we have. He would risk everything to be able to go once more into a tavern in his own country. Certainly the monotony on board must seem intolerable to the Canadian, accustomed as he were as he was, to a life of liberty and activity. Events were rare which would rouse him to any show of spirit, but that day an event did happen which recalled the bright days of the harpooner. About eleven in the morning, being on the surface of the ocean, the Nautilus fell in with a troop of whales, an encounter which didn't astonish me, knowing that these creatures, hunted to death, had taken refuge in high latitudes. We were seated on the platform with a quiet sea, the month of October in those latitudes gave us some lovely autumnal days. It was the Canadian, he could not be mistaken, who signaled a whale on the eastern horizon. Looking attentively, one might see its black back rise and fall with the waves five miles from the Nautilus. Ah, if I was on board a whale, now such a meeting would give me pleasure. It is uh, one of a large size. See with what strength its blowholes throw up columns of air and steam. Confounded, why am I bound to these steel plates? What, Ned? You haven't forgotten your old ideas of fishing. Can a whale fisher ever forget his old trade, sir? Can he ever tire of the emotions caused by such a case, such a chase? You've never fished in these seas. You've never fished in these seas, Ned. Never, sir. In the northern only, and as much as in Bering as the Davis Straits. And the southern whale is still unknown. It's the Greenland whale you've hunted up to this time. That wouldn't risk passing through the warm waters of the equator. Whales are localized according to their kinds in certain seas which they never leave. If one of these creatures went from Bering to Davis Straits, uh, it must have been simply because there is a passage from one sea to the other on either the American or the Asiatic side. In that case, as I have never fished in these seas, I do not know the kind of whale frequenting them. Uh, yes, that is what I just said, Ned. A greater reason for making their acquaintance. No, wait, no, that's Conseil. A greater reason for making their acquaintance. Look, look, they approach, they aggravate me. They know that I cannot get at them. Ned stamped his feet, his hand trembling as he grasped at an, har an imaginary harpoon. Are these cetaceans as large as those of the northern seas? Very nearly, Ned. I have seen large whales, sir, uh, whales measuring a hundred feet. I have been told that those of Holomok and Ungalik of the Aleutian Islands is sometimes a hundred and fifty feet long. That seems to me exaggeration. These creatures are... Oh, wait, no, that's the professor. <laughs> that seems to me exaggeration. These creatures are only balapterons, uh, provided with dorsal fins. Like the cachalots, they're generally much smaller than Greenland whale. 
Ah, exclaimed the Canadian, whose eyes had never left the ocean. They are coming nearer. They are in the same water as the Nautilus. Then returning to the conversation, he said, You spoke of a cachalot as a small creature. I have heard of gigantic ones. They are intelligent cetacea. It is of some that they cover themselves with seaweed and fucus, and then are taken for islands. People encamp upon them and settle there as lights a fire and build houses. <laughs> yes, your care. And one finds aid, the preacher the creature plunges, you know, carrying with it is the inhabitants to the bottom of the sea. <laughs> Sounds like something from the travels of Sinbad the Sailor. <laughs> it is not one whale, there are ten. There are twenty, it's a whole troop. And I'm not able to do anything. Hands and feet die. But, friend Ned, why do you not ask Captain Nemo's permission to chase them? Wait a minute. Okay, I thought I saw Magnus in the kitchen for a second. Sorry. Conseil had not finished his sentence when Ned Land had powered himself through the panel to seek... had lowered himself through the panel to seek the captain. A few minutes afterwards, the two appeared together on the platform. Captain Nemo watched the troop of Cetacea playing on the waters about a mile from the Nautilus. They're in southern Wales. There goes the fortune of a whole fleet of whales. Please, well, sir, can I not chase them, if only to remind me of my old trade of Harpooner? To what purpose? Uh, to what purpose? Only to destroy? We have nothing to do with whale oil on board. But, sir, in the Red Sea you allowed us to follow the dugong. That was to procure fresh meat for my crew. Here would be killing for killing's sake. I know that is a privilege reserved for man, but I do not approve of such murderous pastime. In destroying the southern whale, like the Greenland whale, an offensive creature, your traitors do a culpable action, Master Land. They have already depopulated the whole of Baffin's Bay. They are annihilating a whole class of useful animals. Leave the unfortunate cetacea alone. They have plenty of natural enemies. Cachalots, swordfish, sawfish... Without you, trouble. The captain was right. The barbarous and inconsiderate greed of these fishermen will one day cause the disappearance of the last whale in the ocean. Ned Land whistled Yankee Doodle between his teeth, thrust his hands into his pockets, and tuned his, turned his back upon us. But Captain Nemo watched the troop of Cetacea, and addressing me, said, I was right in saying that whales had natural enemies enough without counting man. These will have plenty to do before long. Do you see, Monsieur Aronax, about eight miles to leeward, these blackish moving points? Yes, Captain. Those are cachalots, terrible animals, which I've met in troops of two or three hundred. As to those, they are cruel, mischievous creatures. They'd be right in exterminate. The, ca the Canadian turned quickly at those last words. Well, Captain, it is still time in the interest of the whales. It's useless to expose oneself, Professor. The Nautilus will disperse them. It's an armed with a steel spur as good as Master Land's harpoon, I imagine. The Canadian did not put himself out enough to shrug his shoulders. Attack Cetacea with blows of a spur. Who would ever heard of such a thing? Wait, Monsieur Arnox. We will show you something you've never yet seen. We have no pity for these ferocious creatures. They're nothing but mouth and teeth. Nothing but mouth and teeth. None, no one could better describe the macroencephalus cachalot, which is sometimes more than 75 feet long. Its enormous head occupies one-third of its entire body. Better armed than the whale, whose upper jaw is furnished only with whalebone, it's supplied with 25 large tusks, about 8 inches long, cylindrical and conical at the top each weighing two pounds. It is in the upper part of this enormous head, in great cavities divided by cartilages, that is to be found from six to eight hundred pounds of that precious oil called spermaceti. The cachalot is a disagreeable creature, more tadpole than fish, according to Fred Hall's description. It's badly formed, the whole of its left side being, if we may see it, a failure, and being only able to see with its right eye. But the formidable troop was nearing us, they had seen the whales when we were preparing to attack them. One could judge beforehand that the cachalots would be victorious, not only because they were better built for attack than their inoffensive adversaries, but also because they could remain longer under the water without coming to surface. There was only just time to go to the help of the, of the whales. The Nautilus went underwater, 
Conseil, Ned Land, and I took our places before the window in the saloon, and Captain Nemo joined the pilot in his cage to work his apparatus as an engine of destruction. Soon I felt the beatings of the screw quicken, and our speed increase. The battle between the cachalots and the whales had already begun when the Nautilus arrived. They did not at first show any fear at the sight of the new monster joining in the conflict, but they soon had to guard against its blows. What a battle! The Nautilus was nothing but a formidable harpoon, brandished by the hand of its captain. It hurled itself against the fleshy mass, passing through from one part to the other, leaving behind it two quivering halves of the animal. It could not feel the formidable blows from their tails upon its sides, nor the shock with which it produced its much more. One cachalot killed, it ran to the next, attacked on the spot that it might not miss its prey, going forwards and backwards. Answering to its helm, plunging when the cetacean dived into the deep waters, coming up with it when it returned to the surface, striking it front or sideways, cutting or tearing in all directions and at any pace, piercing it with a terrible spur. What carnage! What a noise on the surface of the waves! What sharp hissing! What snorting peculiar to these enraged animals! In the midst of these waters, generally so peaceful, their tails made perfect billows. For an entire hour, this wholesale massacre continued, from which the cachalots could not escape. Several times, te several times, ten or twelve, tr united, tried to crush the Nautilus by their weight. From the window, we could see their enormous mouths studded with tusks and their formidable eyes. Ned Land could not contain himself. He threatened and swore at them. We could feel them clinging to our vessel like dogs worrying a wild boar in a copse. But the Nautilus, working its screw, carried them here and there to the upper levels of the ocean without caring for their enormous weight, nor the powerful strain on the vessel. At, the, at length, the mass of cachalots broke up. The waves began quiet, and I felt that we were rising to the surface. The panel opened, and we hurried onto the platform. The sea was covered with mutilated bodies. A formidable explosion couldn't have divided and torn this fleshy mass with more violence. We were floating amid gigantic bodies, bluish on the black, uh, bluish on the back and white underneath, covered with enormous protuberances. Some terrified cachalots were flying toward the horizon. The waves were dyed red for several miles, and the Nautilus floated in the sea of blood. Captain Nemo joined us. Well, Master Land. Well, Master Land. Well, sir, replied the Canadian, whose enthusiasm had somewhat calmed. It is a terrible spectacle, certainly. But I am not a butcher. I am a hunter. I call this butchery. It's a massacre of mischievous creatures. The Nautilus is no butcher's knife. I like my harpoon better. Everyone to his own answered the captain, looking fixedly at Ned Land. I feared that he would commit some act of violence which would end in sad consequences, but his anger was turned by the sight of a whale which the Nautilus had just come up with. The creature had not quite escaped from the cachalot's teeth. I recognized the southern whale by its flat head, which is entirely black. Anatomically, it's distinguished from the white whale and the north cape whale by the seventh cervical vertebrae, and it has two more ribs than its con than its congeners. Congeners? Yeah. Like, contiguous gene earners. Yeah. The unfortunate cetacean was lying on its side, riddled with holes from the bites and quite dead. From its mutilated fin still hung a young whale, which it could not save from the massacre. Its open mouth let the water flow in and out, murmuring like the waves breaking on the shore. Captain Nemo steered close to the corpse of the creature, Two of his, of his men mounted its side, and I saw, not without surprise, that they were drawing from its breasts all the milk which they contained, that is to say, about two or three tons. The captain offered me a cup of the milk, which was still warm. I couldn't help showing my repugnance to the drink, but he assured me it was excellent, not to be distinguished from a cow's milk. I tasted it, and was of his opinion. It was a useful reserve to us, for in the shape of salt, butter, or cheese, it would form an agreeable variety from our ordinary food. From that day I noticed with uneasiness Ned Land's ill will toward Captain Nemo increased, and I resolved to watch the Canadian's gestures close. Well then that's quite the uh 
quite the aggressive note to leave for our uh, intermission. Uh, but uh, it is intermission time, uh, as the chat command tells us. I'm um, taking a short break. Have yourself a little break as well. Stretch, get hydrated, take any necessary medications, love your animals take care of things we'll be back in about 15 minutes it's usually 10 to 15 i'm working on including a timer in the stream itself either way i will turn on a little bit of this music that i have rustled up and uh, we'll be taking a short break we will be right back
Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't get too far into that one. Shush. <laughs> Lowe's Home Improvement, says the captions. They got very confused when I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I did it a little too fast. And it got a little confused with me. One moment. Let me just make sure that everything's not going to break when I switch over to the correct scene. It looks like everything's working fine. Good. Welcome a guest to the show. Library perched atop of the chair. Let's, uh, let's take one last sip of our tea here. And, uh, oh, come on. I sat there and waited so the squirrel bars wouldn't show up on the snow. And what do they do? They decide that it's real scroll bars hours. So rude. Ruining the suspension of disbelief that we have with our nice little snowfall. Anyway. <laughs> Let's dive into chapter 13. The iceberg. Actually, wait a second. Before I do that. I need to open the table of contents. Is this the right button I want? No. That's not it either. Is this the table of contents? This is the table of contents. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 chapters left tonight. Uh, so we're probably not going to finish it. But I figured I'd check. Alright, chapter 13. The Iceberg. The Nautilus was steadily pursuing its southerly course following the 50th meridian with considerable speed. Did he wish to reach the pole? I didn't think so. Every attempt to reach that point had hitherto failed. Again, the season was far advanced, for in the Antarctic regions, the 13th of March corresponds with the 13th of September in northern regions, which began at the equinoctial season. On the 14th of March, I saw floating ice in latitude 55 degrees, merely pale bits of debris from 20 to 25 feet long, forming banks over which the sea curled. The Nautilus remained at the surface of the ocean. Ned Land, who had fished in the Arctic seas, was familiar with its icebergs, but Conseil and I admired them for the first time. In the atmosphere towards the southern horizon stretched a white, dazzling band. English whalers had given it the name of Ice Flake. However thick the, cl however thick the clouds may be, it is always visible and announces the presence of an ice pack or bank. Accordingly, larger blocks soon appeared, whose brilliancy changed with the capricious of fog. Some of these masses showed green veins, as if long, undulating lines had been traced with sulfate of copper. Others resembled enormous amethysts, with a light shining through them. Some reflected the light of day upon a thousand crystal facets. Others shaded with vivid calcareous reflections resembled a perfect town of marble. The more we neared the south, the more these floating islands increased both in number and importance. At sixty degrees latitude, every pass had disappeared, but seeking carefully, Captain Nemo soon found a narrow opening, through which he boldly slipped, knowing, however, that it would close behind him. Thus, guided by this clever hand, the Nautilus passed through all the ice with a precision which quite charmed Conseil. Icebergs or mountains, ice fields or smooth plains, seeming to have no limits, drift ice or floating ice packs, plains broken up, called paltch when they're circular, and streams when they're made up of long strips. The temperature was very low. The thermometer exposed to the air marked two degrees or three degrees below zero. But we were warmly clad with fur and the expense of a sea bear and seal. The interior of the Nautilus, warmed regularly by its electric apparatus, defied the most intense cold. Besides, it would only have been necessary to go some yards beneath the waves to find a more bearable temperature. Two months earlier, we, should, we would have had perpetual daylight in these latitudes, but we already had had three or four hours of night, and by and by there would be six months of darkness in these circumpolar regions. On the 15th of March, we were in the latitude of New Shetland and South Orkney. The captain told me that formerly numerous tribes of seals inhabited them, but that English and American whalers, in their rage for destruction, massacred both old and young. Thus, where there was once life and animation, they had left silence and death. About eight o'clock, on the morning of the 16th of March, the Nautilus, 
following the 55th meridian, cut the Antarctic polar circle. Ice surrounded us on all sides and closed the horizon, but Captain Nemo went from one opening to another, still going higher. I cannot express my astonishment at the beauties of these new regions. The ice took most surprising forms. Here the grouping formed an oriental town with innumerable mosques and minarets. There, a fallen city thrown to the earth, as it were, by some convulsion of nature. The whole aspect was constantly changed by the oblique rays of the sun, or lost in the grayest fog amidst hurricanes of snow. Detonations and falls were heard on all sides, great overthrows of icebergs, which altered the whole landscape like a diorama. Often seeing no exit, I thought we were definitely prisoners. But instinct guiding him at the slightest indication, Captain Nemo would discover a new pass. He was never mistaken when he saw the thin threads of bluish water trickling among the ice fields, and I had no doubt that he had already ventured into the midst of these Antarctic seas before. On the 16th of March, however, the ice fields completely blocked our road. It was not the iceberg itself as yet, but vast fields cemented by the cold. But this obstacle could not stop Captain Nemo. He hurled himself against it with frightful violence. The Nautilus entered the brittle mass like a wedge and split it with frightful crackings. It was the battering ram of the ancients hurled by an infinite strength. The ice thrown high in the air fell like hail around us. By its own power of impulsion, our apparatus made a canal for itself, sometimes carried away by its own impetus. It lodged on the ice field, crushing it with its weight, and sometimes buried beneath it, dividing by a simple pitching movement, producing large rents in it. With violent gales assailed us at this time, accompanied by thick fogs through which, from one end of the platform to the other, we could see nothing. The wind blew sharply from all points of the compass, and the snow lay in such hard heaps we had to break it with blows of a pickaxe. The temperature was always at five degrees below zero. Every outward part of the Nautilus was covered with ice. A rigged vessel would have been entangled in the blocked-up gorges. A vessel without sails, with electricity for its motive power and wanting no coal, could alone brave such high latitudes. At length, on the 18th of March, after many useless assaults, the Nautilus was positively blocked. It was no longer either streams, packs, or ice field, but an interminable and immovable barrier formed by mountains soldered together. A nice bed, said the Canadian to me. I knew that to Ned Land, as well as to all the other navigators who had preceded us, this was an inevitable obstacle. The sun appeared for an instant at noon. Captain Nemo took an observation as near as possible which gave our situation at 51 degrees 30 minutes longitude and 67 degrees 39 minutes south latitude. We had advanced one degree more in this Antarctic region. Of the liquid surface of the sea there was no longer a glimpse. Under the spur of the Nautilus lay stretched a vast plain, entangled with confused blocks. Here and there sharp points and slender needles rising to a height of 200 feet. Further on a steep shore, hewn as it were with an axe and clothed with grayish tints. Huge mirrors, reflecting a few rays of sunshine, half-drowned in the fog. And over this desolate face of nature, a stern silence reigned, scarcely broken by the flapping of the wings of petrels and puffins. Everything was frozen, even the noise. The Nautilus was then obliged to stop in its adventurous course amidst these fields of ice. In spite of our efforts, in spite of the powerful means employed to break up the ice, the Nautilus remained immovable. Generally, when we can proceed no further, we will we have return still open to us. But here, return was as impassable as advance, for every pass had closed behind us, and for the few moments that we were stationary, we were likely to be entirely blocked, which did indeed happen about two o'clock in the afternoon, the fresh ice forming around its sides with astonishing rapidity. I was, a, I was obliged to admit that Captain Nemo was more than impu imprudent. I was on the platform at that moment. The captain had been observing our situation for some time past when he said to me, Well, sir, what do you think of this? I think we're caught, Captain. So, Monsieur Aronnax, do you really think the Nautilus cannot disengage itself? With difficulty, Captain. The season's already far too advanced for you to reckon on the breaking of the ice. Oh, sir, you'll always be the same. You see nothing but difficulties and obstacles. I affirm that not only can the Nautilus disengage itself, they can also go further still. 
further to the south? Yes, sir, it'll go to the pole. To the pole? Unable to repress my gestures of incredulity. Yes. Uh, yes, to the Antarctic pole. To that unknown point from whence springs every meridian of the globe. You know whether I can do as I please with an otis. Yes, I knew that. I knew the man was bold, even to rashness, but to conquer these obstacles which bristled round the South Pole, rendering it more inaccessible than the North, which had not yet been reached by a bolder navigator. Was it not a mad enterprise, one which only a maniac could have conceived? It then came into my head to ask Captain Nemo if he had ever discovered that pole which had never yet been trodden by a human creature. No, sir, but we'll discover it together. Where others have failed, I will not fail. I have never yet led my Nautilus so far into the southern sea, but I repeat it shall go further yet. I can well believe you, Captain. I believe you. Let us go ahead. There's no obstacles for us. Let us smash the iceberg, blow it up, and if it resists, let's give the Nautilus wings to fly over. Over it, sir. No, not over it, but under it. Uh, under it? I exclaimed, a sudden idea of the captain's pro projects flashing upon my mind. I understood. The wonderful qualities of the Nautilus were going to serve us in this superhuman enterprise. Uh, I see we're beginning to understand one another, sir. You begin to see the possibility, I should say, the success of this attempt. That which is impossible for an ordinary vessel is easy to the Nautilus. If a continent lies before the pole, it must stop before the continent. But if, on the contrary, the pole is washed by open sea, it will go even to the pole. Certainly, said I, carried away by the captain's reasoning. If the surface of the sea is solidified by ice, the lower depths are free by the providential law, which has placed the maximum of density of the waters of the ocean one degree higher than freezing point. If I'm not mistaken, the portion of this iceberg which is above the water is as one to four that is which below. Very nearly, sir. For one foot of iceberg above the sea, there are three below it. If these ice mountains are not more than 300 feet above the surface, they're not more than 900 beneath. And what's 900 feet to the Nautilus? Nothing, sir. It could even seek at greater depths of the uniform temperature of seawater. There brave with impunity the 30 or 40 degrees of surface pole. Just so, sir. Just so. The only difficulty is that of remaining several days without renewing our provision of air. Is that all? The Nautilus has a vast reservoir. We can fill them. They will supply us with the oxygen we want. Well thought of, Aranax. But not wishing you to accuse me of rashness, I'll first give you all my objections. Do you have any more to make? Only one. It's possible, if the sea exists at the South Pole, that it may be covered, and consequently we'll, sh we'll be unable to come to the surface. Good sir, but do you forget that the Nautilus is armed with a powerful spur? We could not send it diagonally against these fields of ice which would open at the shocks? Sir, you're full of ideas today. Besides, Captain, why should we not find the sea open at the South Pole as well as the North? The frozen poles of the Earth don't coincide, neither in the southern or northern regions. Until it's proved to the contrary, we may suppose either a continent or an ocean free from ice at the two points of the globe. I think so too, Monsieur Arnaz. I only wish to observe that after having made so many objections to my project, you are now crushing me with arguments in its favor. The preparations for this audacious attempt now began. The powerful pumps of the Nautilus were working air into the reservoirs and storing it at higher and higher pressure. About four o'clock, Captain Nemo announced the closing of the panels on the platform. I threw one last look at the massive iceberg which we were going to cross. The weather was clear, the atmosphere pure enough, the cold very great, twelve below zero. But the wind having gone down, this temperature was not so unbearable. Sorry, I, I had to chuckle at that. Twelve below zero, even in still air, is quite unpleasant unless you are dressed collect correctly and actively moving every second of it. <laughs> and that's speaking from someone who has trouble feeling cold until about 20 to 15 degrees. So, anyway, about 10 men mounted the sides of the Nautilus, armed with pickaxes to break the ice around the vessel, which was soon free. 
The operation was quickly performed, but the fresh ice was still very thin. We all went below. The usual reservoirs were filled with the newly liberated water, and the Nautilus soon descended. I had taken my place with Conseil in the saloon. Through the open window, we could see the lower beds of the southern ocean. The thermometer went up. The needle of the compass deviated on the dial. At about 900 feet, as Captain Nemo had foreseen, we were floating beneath the undulating bottom of that iceberg. But the Nautilus went lower still, went to the depth of 400 fathoms. The temperature of the water at the surface showed 12 degrees. It was now only 10. We'd gained two. I need not say the temperature of the Nautilus was raised by its heating apparatus to a much higher degree. Every maneuver was accomplished with wonderful precision. We shall pass it, if you please, sir. I believe we shall. In this open sea, the Nautilus had taken its course direct to the pole, without leaving the 52nd meridian. From 67 degrees 30 minutes to 90 degrees, 22 degrees and a half of latitude remained to travel. That is, about 500 leagues. The Nautilus kept up a mean speed of 26 miles an hour, about the speed of an express train. If that was kept up, in 40 hours we should reach the pole. For a part, the night, for a part the night, the novelty of the situation kept us at the window. The sea was lit with the electric lantern, but it was deserted. Fishes didn't sojourn in these imprisoned waters. They only found there a passage to take them from the Antarctic Ocean to the open polar sea. Our pace was rapid. We could feel it by the quivering of the long steel body. About two in the morning I took some hours' repose, and Conseil did the same. In crossing the waste I did not meet Captain Nemo. I supposed him to be in the pilot's cage. The next morning, the 19th of March, I took my post once more in the saloon. The electric log told me that the speed of the Nautilus had been slackened. It was then going toward the surface, but prudently emptying its reservoirs very slowly. My heart beat fast. Were we going to emerge and regain the open polar atmosphere? No. A shock told me that the Nautilus had struck the bottom of the iceberg, still very thick, judging from the deadened sound. We had indeed struck, to use a sea expression, but in an inverse sense, and at a thousand feet deep. This would give three thousand feet of ice above us, one thousand above being above the water. The iceberg was then higher than at its borders, not a very reassuring fact. Several times that day, the Nautilus tried again, and every time it struck the wall which lay like a ceiling above it. Sometimes it met with but 900 yards, only 200 of which rose above the surface. It was twice the height it was when the Nautilus had gone under the waves. I carefully noted the different depths, and thus obtained a submarine profile of the chain as it was developed under water. That night, no change had taken place in our situation. Still ice between four and 500 yards in depth. It was evidently diminishing, but still, what a thickness between us and the surface of the ocean. It was then eight. According to the daily custom on board the Nautilus, its air should have been renewed four hours ago, but I didn't suffer much, although Captain Nemo had not yet made any demand upon his reserve of oxygen. My sleep was painful that night. Hope and fear besieged me by turns. I rose several times. The groping of the Nautilus continued. About three in the morning, I noticed that the lower surface of the iceberg was only about fifty feet deep. One hundred and fifty feet now separated us from the surface of the water. The iceberg was by degrees becoming an ice field, the mountain a plain. My eyes never left the monometer. We were still rising diagonally to the surface, which sparkled under the electric rays. The iceberg was stretching both above and beneath into lengthening slopes. Mile after mile it was getting thinner. At length, at six in the morning of that memorable day, the 19th of March, the door of the saloon opened and Captain Nemo appeared. The sea is open, was all he said. Library has chosen quite a good spot to mirror. Good boy, kitty. Uh, let's continue. Chapter 14, The South Pole. I rushed onto the platform. Yes. The open sea, with but a few scattered pieces of ice and moving icebergs. A long stretch of sea. A world of birds in the air. Myriads of fishes under those waters, which varied from intense blue to olive green, according to the bottom. 
The thermometer marked three degrees Celsius above zero. It was comparatively spring shut up as we were behind this iceberg, whose lengthened mass was dimly seen on our northern horizon. Are we at the pole? I do not know. At noon I will take our bearings. But will the sun show himself through the fog? However little it shows, it will be enough. About ten miles south, a solitary island rose to a height of a hundred and four yards. We made for it, but carefully, for the sea might be strewn with banks. One hour afterwards we had reached it. Two hours later we'd made the round of it. It measured four or five miles in circumference. A narrow canal separated it from a considerable stretch of land. Perhaps a continent, for we could not see its limits. The existence of this land seemed to give some color to Maury's theory. The ingenious American has remarked that between the South Pole and the 60th parallel, the sea is covered with floating ice of enormous size, which is never met with in the North Atlantic. From this fact, he has drawn the conclusion that the Antarctic, the Antarctic Circle, encloses considerable continents, as icebergs cannot form an open sea, but only on coasts. According to these calculations, the mass of ice surrounding the southern pole forms a vast cap, the circumference of which must be at least 2,500 miles. But the Nautilus, for fear of running aground, had stopped about three cable lengths from a strand over which reared a superb heap of rocks. The boat was launched. The captain, two of his men bearing instruments, could sail, and myself were in it. It was ten in the morning. I had not seen Ned Land. Doubtless the Canadian didn't wish to admit the presence of the South Pole. A few strokes of the oar brought us to the sand where we ran ashore. Conseil was going to jump on the land when I held him back. Sir, sir, said I to Captain Nemo, to you belongs the honor of first setting foot on this land. Yes, sir. And if I do not hesitate to tread this south pole, it's because up to this time no human being has left a trace there. Saying this, he jumped lightly onto the sand. His heart beating with emotion, he climbed a rock, sloping to a little promontory, and there, with his arms crossed, mute and motionless, and with an eager look, he seemed to take possession of these southern regions. After five minutes passing in this ecstasy, he turned to us. When you like, sir. I landed, followed by Conseil, leaving the two men in the boat. For a long way, the soil was composed of a reddish sandy stone, something like crushed brick. Scoriae, streams of lava, and pumice stones. One could not mistake its volcanic origin. In some parts, slight curls of smoke emitted a sulfurous smell, proving that the internal fires had lost nothing of their expansive powers, though, having climbed a high acclivity, I could see no volcano for a radius of several miles. We know that in those Antarctic countries, James Ross found two craters, the Erebus and Terror, in full activity on the 167th meridian, Latitude 77 degrees, 32 minutes. The vegetation of this desolate continent seemed to me much restricted. Some lichens lay upon the black rocks, some microscopic plants, rudimentary diatomas, a kind of cells placed between two quartz shells. Long purple and scarlet weed supported on little swimming bladders, which the breaking of the waves brought to the shore. These constituted the meager floor of this region. The shore was strewn with mollusks, little mussels, and limpets. I also saw myriads of northern cleos, one and a quarter inches long, of which a whale would swallow a whole world in a mouthful, and some perfect sea butterflies animating the waters on the skirts of the shore. There appeared on the high bottoms some coral shrubs, of the kind which, according to James Ross, live in the Antarctic seas to the depth of more than a thousand yards. Then there were little kingfishers and starfish studding the soil, but where life abounded most was in the air. There thousands of birds fluttered and flew of all kinds, deafening us with their cries. Others crowded the rock, looking at us as we passed by without fear, and pressing familiarly close to our feet. There were penguins so agile in the water, heavy and awkward as they are on the ground. They were uttering harsh cries a large assembly, sober in gesture but extravagant in clamor. Albatrosses passed the air, the expanse of their wings being at least four yards and a half, and justly called the vultures of the ocean. Some gigantic pest some gigantic petrels and damiers, a small a, a kind of small duck, the under part of whose body is black and white. Then there were a whole series of petrels, 
some whitish with brown bordered wings, others blue, peculiar to the Antarctic seas, and so oily, as I told Conseil, that the inhabitants of the Faroe Islands had nothing to do before lighting them, but to put a wick in. A little more and they'd be perfect lamps. After all, after that, we cannot expect nature to have previously furnished them with wicks. After, about half a mile farther on the soil was riddled with rough's nests. A, a sort of laying ground, out of which many birds were issued. Captain Nemo had some hundreds hunted. They uttered a cry like the braying of, of a donkey, were about the size of a goose, slate color on their body, white beneath, with a yellow line round their throats. They allowed themselves to be killed with a stone, never trying to escape. But the fog didn't live, and at, the, uh, and at eleven the sun had not yet shown us. Its absence made me uneasy. Without it, no observations were possible. How then could we decide whether we'd reached the pole? When I rejoined Captain Nemo, I found him leaning on a piece of rock, silently watching the sky. He seemed impatient and vexed. But what was to be done? This rash and powerful man could not command the sun as he did the sea. Noon arrived without the orb of day showing itself for even an instant. We couldn't even tell its position behind the curtain of fog, and soon that fog turned to snow. I have to remember that all of these Antarctic observations are being made from, you know, essentially making educated guesses based on the work of, like, Admondson and Ross and, like, early, early Antarctic explorers, because I'm like, this is all nonsense, but, like, they didn't have a lot of information to extrapolate from, you know, the, the, the furthest, you know, the Scott mission and the Admondson mission and, you know, the, the adventures listed in the book, you know, they, they got not super far off of the, you know, uh, the ice pack coasts of Antarctica. So, like, these are reasonable guesses based on, you know, assuming that there's going to be a chunk in the middle of Antarctica that's temperate, which I don't know where that assumption came from. Apparently that American that got mentioned, I don't know if that's actually who it came from, but now I'm curious to learn why, because it crops up in a lot of things, you know? It crops up here, and it crops it cropped up in several of the uh, astounding stories pulps we were reading, let alone all the other pulps I haven't uh, been able to read on the show. But I digress. Till tomorrow, said the captain, quietly, and we return to the Nautilus amid these atmospheric disturbances. I'm not sure I can do the captain's voice quietly. The tempest of snow continued till the next day. It was impossible to remain on the platform. From the saloon, where I was taking notes of incidents happening during this excursion to the polar continent, I could hear the cries of petrels and albatrosses sporting in the midst of this violent storm. The, uh, the Nautilus did not remain motionless, but skirted the coast, advancing ten miles more to the south in the half-light left by the sun as it skirted the edge of the horizon. The next day, the 20th of March, the snow had ceased. The cold was a little greater, the thermometer showing two below zero. The fog was rising, and I hoped that that day our observations might be taken. Captain Nemo not having yet appeared, the boat took Conseil and myself to land. The soil was still of the same volcanic nature. Everywhere were traces of lava, scoriae, and basalt, but the crater which had vomited them I could not see. Here, as lower down, this continent was alive with myriads of birds, but their rule was now divided with large troops of sea mammals looking at us with their soft eyes. There were several kinds of seals, some stretched on the earth, some on flakes of ice, many going in and out of the sea. They did not flee at our approach, and never having had anything to do they did not flee at our approach, never having had anything to do with man, and I reckon that there were provisions there for hundreds of vessels. Sir, will you tell me the names of these creatures? They're seals and that, rather, their seals and morses. It was eight in the morning. Four hours remained to us before the sun could be observed with advantage. I directed our steps toward a vast bay cut in steep granite shore. There I can aver that earth and ice were lost to sight with a number of sea mammals covering them. And I involuntarily sought for old Proteus, the mythological shepherd who watched these immense flocks of Neptune. There were more seals than anything else, forming distinct groups, male and female, father watching over his family, mother suckling her little ones, some already strong enough to go a few steps. 
When they wished to change their place, they took little jumps, made by the contraction of their bodies, and helped awkwardly enough by their imperfect fin, which, as with the lamentin, their cousins, forms a perfect form. I should say that in the water, which is their element, the spine of these creatures is flexible. With smooth and close skin and webbed feet, they swim admirably. In resting on the earth, they take the most graceful attitudes. Thus the ancients, observing their soft and expressive looks, which cannot be surpassed by the most beautiful look a woman can give, their clear, voluptuous eyes, their charming positions, and the poetry of their manners metamorphose them. The male into a triton, and the female into a mermaid. I made Conseil notice the considerable, develop considerable development of the lobes of the brain in these interesting cetaceans. No mammal except a man has such a quantity of brain matter. They're also capable of receiving a certain amount of education. They're easily domesticated, and I think with other naturalists that if properly taught, they'd be of great service as fishing dogs. The greater part of them slept on the rocks or on the sand. Amidst those seals, so properly called, which have no external ears, in which they differ from the otter, whose ears are prominent, I noticed several varieties of seals about three yards long, with a white coat, bulldog head, armed with teeth in both jaws, four in size at the top and four at the bottom, and two large canine teeth in the shape of a fleur de lis. Amongst them, gilded sea elephants, a kind of seal with short, flexible trunks. The giants of this species measured twenty feet round and ten yards and a half in length. But they did not move as we approached. These creatures aren't dangerous? No, not unless you attack them. When they have to defend their young, their rage is terrible, and it's not uncommon for them to break the fishing boats to pieces. Library. Knowingly. Hopped up onto the table. Oh, he's not happy with me. He is maximum zoom right now. He's like, The world may not see my beans, Father. I cannot handle such indignities, please. And this is what we get for jumping on the table. You know the table's off limits. <laughs> Let me go, Papa. Nope. The world must see your beans. I must embarrass you in front of the whole internet. For your for your naughty crimes. He's like, nope, I'm gonna guide your eyes out, Papa. Alright, okay. I've embarrassed you sufficiently. Or was I fishing boats to pieces? That's where I was. They're quite right. I don't say they're not. Two miles farther on. Two miles farther on, we were stopped by the promontory which shelters the bay from the southerly winds. Beyond it, we heard loud bells, such as a troop of ruminants would produce. Good, a concert of bulls. No, a concert of morses. They're fighting. They're either fighting or playing. Sorry, I thought I heard library hassling the curtain. Uh, I have to stop them any time they hassle the two curtains, because the curtains are on curtain rods, shocker, and the curtains will fall if they're jostled a little too hard, and knowing my luck, the curtain would bonk on my cat, and it would make me very sad. Anyway, we now began to climb the blackish rocks amid unforeseen stumbles and over stones which the ice made slippery. More than once I rolled over at the expense of my loins. Conseil, more prudent, or perhaps more steady, didn't stumble and helped me up, saying, If, sir, you would have the kindness to take wider steps, you would preserve your equilibrium better. Arrived at the upper ridge of the promontory, I saw a vast white plain covered with morses. They were playing amidst themselves, and what we heard were bellowings of pleasure, not anger. Bless you. Bless you. You got one more? Nope, just two. Okay. As I passed these curious animals, I could examine them leisurely, for they did not move. Their skins were thick and rugged, with a yellowish tint approaching to red. Their hair was short and scant. Some of them were four yards and a quarter long. Quieter and less timid than their cousins of the north, they did not, like them, place sentinels round the outskirts of their encampment. After examining the city of Morses, I began to think of returning. It was eleven o'clock, after all, and if Captain Nemo found the conditions favorable for operation observations, I wished to be present at that operation. We followed a narrow pathway running along the summit of the steep shore, and at half-past eleven we had reached the place where we landed. The boat had run aground, bringing the captain. I saw him standing on a block of basalt, 
his instruments near him, his eyes fixed on the northern horizon, near which the sun was then describing a lengthened curve. I took my place beside him and waited without speaking. Noon arrived, and as before, the sun did not appear. It was a fatality. Observations were still wanting. If not accomplished tomorrow, we must give up all idea of taking any of them. We were indeed at the ex exactly the 20th of March. Tomorrow, the 21st, would be the equinox. The sun would disappear behind the horizon for six months, and with its disappearance, the long polar night would begin. Since the September equinox, it had since the September equinox, it had emerged from the northern horizon, rising by lengthened spirals up to the 21st of December. At this period, the summer solstice, the summer solstice of the at this period, the summer solstice of the northern regions had begun to descend, and tomorrow it was to shed its last rays upon them. I communicated my fears and observations to Captain Nemo. You're right, Monsieur Holmes. If tomorrow I cannot take, if I cannot take the altitude of the sun, I shall not be able to do it for six months. But precisely because chance has led me to these seas on the twenty-first of March, my bearings will be easy to take. If at twelve we can see the sun. Why, Captain? Because the, then the orb of day describes such lengthened curves that it's difficult to measure exactly its height above the horizon. Grave errors may be made with instruments. What will you do then? I shall only use my chronometer. If tomorrow, the 21st of March, the disk of the sun, allowing for refraction, is exactly cut at the northern horizon, it will show that I'm at the south pole. Just so, but the statement is not mathematically correct. The equinox doesn't necessarily begin at noon. <laughs> Sorry, Magnus was uh, rotating his head, and it was confusing me. No, you leave that computer alone. It didn't do nothing to you. Papa, those look like string. They are not string. They are very expensive cables if you pull on them. <sighs> do not jump down from there. Hey, you, sir, sir, sir. <laughs> He's like, no, no press questions. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry, I to dissuade my cats from doing something, I hold an imaginary press microphone in their face, and they've gotten sick of the bit, so. Mm. Anyway, uh, the equinox is ne not necessarily beginning at noon. That's where we were. Very likely, sir. Very likely, sir. But the error will not be 100 yards, and we don't want more. Till tomorrow. Captain Nemo returned on board. Conseil and I returned. Conseil and I remained to study the shore, observing and studying until five o'clock. Then I went to bed, not, however, without invoking, like the Indian, the favor of the radiant orb. The next day, the twenty-first of March, at five in the morning, I mounted the platform, and I found Captain Nemo there. The weather is lightning, and I have some hope. After breakfast, we will go on shore and choose a post for observation. That point settled, I sought Ned Land. I wanted to take him with me, but the obstinate Canadian refused, and I saw that his taciturnity and bad humor grew day by day. After all, I was not sorry for his obstinacy under the circumstances. Indeed, there were too many seals on shore. We ought not to lay such temptation in an unreflecting fisherman's way. Breakfast over, we went on shore. The Nautilus had gone some miles further up in the night. It was a whole league from the coast, above which reared a sharp peak about five hundred yards high. The boat took with me Captain Nemo, two men of the crew, and, an, and the instruments, which consisted of a chronometer, a telescope, and a barometer. While crossing, I saw numerous whales belonging to the three kinds peculiar to the southern seas. The whale, or the English right whale, which has no dorsal fin. The humpback, with wreathed chest and large whitish fins, which, despite of its name, do not form wings. And the finback of a yellowish-brown, the liveliest of all the cetacea. This powerful creature is heard a long way off when he throws to a great height columns of air and vapor, which look like whirlwinds of smoke. 
These different mammals were disporting themselves in the troops of quiet water, and I could see that this basin of the Antarctic Pole served as a place of refuge to the cetacea too closely tracked by the hunters. I also noticed large medusae floating between the reeds. At nine we landed. The sky was bright, the clouds were flying to the south, and the fog seemed to be leaving the cold surface of the water. Captain Nemo went toward the peak, which he doubtless meant to be his observatory. It was a painful ascent over sharp lava and pumice stones, in an atmosphere often impregnated with a sulfurous smell from a smoking crack. For a man unaccustomed to walk on land, the captain climbed the steep, steep slopes with an agility I never saw equaled, and which a hunter would have envied. We were two hours getting to the stomach, summit of this peak, which, which was half porphyry and half basalt. From thence we looked upon a, a vast sea, which toward the north distinctly traced its boundary line along the sky. At our feet lay fields of dazzling whiteness, over our heads a pale azure free from fog. To the north the disk of the sun seemed like a ball of fire, already horned by the cutting of the horizon. From the bosom of the water rose sheaves of liquid jets the sheaves of liquid jets by hunger. Hun Let's try that line again. From the bosom of the water rose sheaves of liquid jets by the hundreds. In the distance lay the Nautilus like a cetacean asleep on the water. Behind us, to the south and east, an immense country in a chaotic heap of rocks and ice, the limits of which were not visible. On arriving at the summit, Captain Nemo carefully took the mean height of that barometer, for he would have, for he would have to consider that in taking his observation. At a quarter to twelve, the sun, then seen only by refraction, looked like a golden disk shedding its last rays upon this deserted continent and seas which never man had yet ploughed. Captain Nemo, furnished with a lenticular glass which, by means of a mirror, corrected the refraction, watched the orb sinking below the horizon by degrees, following a lengthened diagonal. I held the chronometer. My heart beat fast. If at the disappearance of the half-disk of the sun coincided with twelve o'clock on the chron chronometer, we were at the pole itself. Twelve! I exclaimed. The South Pole, replied Captain Nemo in a grave voice, handing me the glass which showed the orb cut in exactly equal parts by the horizon. I looked at the last rays crowning the peak, and the shadows mounting by degrees up its slopes. At that moment Captain Nemo, resting with his hand on my shoulder, said, I, Captain Nemo, on this 21st day of March, 1868, have reached the South Pole on the 90th degree, and I take possession of this part of the globe equal to one-sixth of the known continents. In whose name, Captain? In my own, sir. Saying which, Captain Nemo unfurled a black banner bearing an N in gold quartered on its bunting. Then, turning towards the orb of day, whose last rays lapped the horizon of the sea, he exclaimed, Adieu, son, disappear, thou radiant orb. Rest beneath this open sea, and let a night of six months spread its shadows over my new domains. Now that's how you end the chapter, huh? Alright, chapter 15. Despite the cat sipping and zooming. They're both looking at me like, Ooh, you're usually asleep during this. You're not able to cause nearly as many problems. <laughs> Poor cats. Papa. The white on blue looks festive, but it's hard to read. Oh, heck. Uh, yeah, I was trying to get the white on blue to, like, blend into the snow. Uh, let me see if I can fix that. I didn't notice it was difficult to read. Uh... Well, I seem to have accidentally fixed it. <laughs> Heck. It's all good if you're going for festive. Uh, no, I'd prefer it to be readable than to, you know, be uh, well-themed, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's much more important that people can actually understand what's on the screen. Uh, I, if I could get the CSS to work, because you can apply CSS to, like, arbitrary CSS to these books, uh, somewhere in the menus of the book reader I'm using, but I can't get it to work. 
like there's a little inspect element thing it's like yeah this is the this is the layout of the book and this is the css that applies and i'm trying i've been trying to apply my custom css theme i'm trying to what i really want to do is uh have the background really blend in better by magical computer nonsense that I know about um, and then have the text be white text with a black outline like the rest of the layout uh, but if I can't apply any of my computer magics to the screen uh, that don't work <laughs> so uh, I, I, I have been poking at it uh, in the spare time that I have. Uh, eventually I'll get it to work and I'll be very proud of myself. Just gotta give it a couple more wackus bonks over the head with the CSS stick. Anyway, now that I've uh, pulled back the curtain a little too long and you see me frantically flicking levers, pay no attention, uh, let's, get, let's get into chapter 15. Accident or Incident. The next day, the 22nd of March, at 6 in the morning, preparations for departure were begun. The last gleams of twilight were melting into night. The cold was great, the constellations shone with wonderful intensity. In the zenith glittered that wondrous southern cross, the polar bear of Antarctic regions. The thermometer showed 120 below zero, and when the wind freshened, it was most biting. Flakes of ice increased on the open water. Sea seemed everywhere alike. Numerous blackish patches, numerous blackish patches, spread on the surface, showing the formation of fresh ice. Evidently, the southern basin, frozen during the six winter months, was absolutely inaccessible. What became of the whales in that time? Doubtless, they went beneath the icebergs, seeking more practicable seas. As to the seal and morses, accustomed to live in a hard climate, they remained on these icy shores. These creatures have the instinct to break holes in the ice field and to keep them open. To these holes they come for breath, and the birds, driven away by the cold, have emigrated to the north. These sea mammals remain the sole masters of the polar continent. But the reservoirs were filling with water, and the Nautilus was slowly descending. At one thousand feet deep it stopped. Its screw beat the waves, and it advanced straight toward the north at a speed of fifteen miles per hour. Towards night it was already floating underneath the immense body of the iceberg. At three in the morning I was awakened by a violent shock. I sat up in my bed and listened in the darkness when I was thrown into the middle of the room. The Nautilus, after having struck, had rebounded violently. I groped along the partition and by the staircase to the saloon which was lit by the luminous ceiling. The furniture was upset. Fortunately the windows were firmly set and had held fast. The pictures on the starboard side from being no longer vertical, were clinging to the paper, whilst those on the port side were hanging at least a foot from the wall. The Nautilus was lying on its starboard side, perfectly motionless. I heard footsteps and a confusion of voices, but Captain Nemo didn't appear. As I was leaving the saloon, Ned Land and Conseil entered. Well, what's the matter? I came to ask you, sir. Confound it. I know well enough. The Nautilus has struck. And judging by the way she lies, I do not think she will right herself as she did the first time in Torres Straits. But has she at least come to the surface of the sea? We do not know. It's easy to decide, and I consulted the manometer. To my great surprise, it showed a depth of more than 180 fathoms. What does that mean? I exclaimed. Excuse me. Magnus. Sir. Are you aware that the picking at the door is off limits? You know what this means. He's like, oh no, I do know what this means. This means the world gets to see your beans, naughty man. Yeah. The world gets to see your beans because you've been a naughty boy. Bad and naughty boys get your beans shown. Dim's the rules, kid cat. Yeah. Well, you know to leave the door alone. Beans! He's like, oh god, I hate this. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully the world got to see beans, because he was very upset with me for that. 
Much more than usual. <laughs> oh, beans. Anyway, where was I? Uh, we are 180 fathoms below below the surface of the ocean. That's, that's where we were. We must ask Captain Nemo. But where shall we find him? F follow me. We left the saloon. There was no one in the library. Center staircase. By the berths of the ship's crew, there was no one. I thought that Captain Nemo must be in the pilot's cage. It was best to wait. We all returned to the saloon, and for twenty minutes we remained thus, trying to hear the slightest noise which might be made on board the Nautilus when Captain Nemo entered. He seemed not to see us. His face, generally so impassive, showed signs of uneasiness. He watched the compass silently, then the manometer, and going to the planisphere, placed a finger on a spot representing the southern seas. I wouldn't interrupt him, but some, t some minutes later, when he turned toward me, I said, using one of his own expressions in the Taurus Straits, An incident, Captain? No, sir. An accident this time. Serious? Perhaps. Is the danger immediate? No. The Nautilus is stranded? Yes. And this has happened how? From a comp uh, rather, from a compressive nature, not from the ignorance of man. Not a mistake has been made in the working, but we cannot prevent equilibrium from producing its effects. We may brave human laws, but we can't resist natural ones. Captain Nemo had chosen a strange moment for uttering this philosophical reflection. On the whole, his answer helped me little. Uh, may I ask, sir, the cause of this accident? An enormous block of ice, a whole mountain is turned over. When icebergs are undermined at their base by warmer water or reiterated shocks, their center of gravity rises, and the whole thing turns over. This is what happened. One of these blocks, as it fell, struck the Nautilus, then, gliding under its hull, raised it with irresistible force, bringing it onto beds which are not so thick where it is lying on its side. But can we not get the Nautilus off by empty its, emptying its reservoirs that it might regain its equilibrium? That, sir, is being done at this moment. You can hear the pump working. Look at the needle of the manometer. It shows the Nautilus is rising, but the block of ice is floating with it, and until some obstacle stops its ascending motion, our position cannot be altered. Indeed, the Nautilus still held the same position as starboard. Doubtless it would right itself when the block stopped, but at this moment, who knows if we may not be frightfully crushed between two glassy, between the two glassy surfaces. I reflected on all the consequences of our position. Captain Nemo never took his eyes off the manometer. Since the fall of the iceberg, the Nautilus had risen about 150 feet, but it still made the same angle with the perpendicular. Suddenly, a slight movement was felt in the hold. Evidently, it was riding a little. Things hanging in the saloon were sensibly returning to their normal position. The partitions were nearing the upright, and no one spoke. With beating hearts, we watched and felt the straightening. The boards became horizontal under our feet, and ten minutes passed. At last we've righted. Yes, said Captain Nemo, going to the door of the saloon. But are we floating? Certainly, since the reservoirs are not empty, and when empty, the Nautilus must rise to the surface of the sea. We were in open sea but at a distance of about ten yards on either side of the Nautilus rose a dazzling wall of ice, above and beneath the same wall. Above, because the lower surface of the iceberg stretched over us like an immense, immense ceiling, and beneath, because the overturned block, having slid by degrees, had found a resting place in the lateral walls which kept it in that position. The Nautilus was really imprisoned in a perfect tunnel of ice more than twenty yards in breadth, filled with quiet water. It was easy to get out of it by going either forward or backward, and then make a free passage under the iceberg some hundreds of yards deeper. The luminous ceiling had been extinguished, but the saloon was still resplendent with intense light. It was the powerful reflection from the glass partition set violently back to the sheets of the lantern. I cannot describe the effect of voltaic rays upon the great blocks so capriciously cut every angle, Every ridge, every facet was thrown a different light, according to the nature of the veins running through the ice. 
a dazzling mine of gems, particularly of sapphires, their blue rays crossing with the green of the emerald. Here and there were opal shades of soft, wonderful softness, running through bright spots like diamonds of fire, the brilliancy of which the eye could not bear. The power of the lantern seemed increased a hundredfold, like a lamp through the lenticular plates of a first-class lighthouse. This really makes for a fantastic image. And something to keep in mind is, uh, in pressures found in an iceberg of this size, uh, ice starts to behave differently to what we expect, you know, when we see it in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, uh, obviously, you know, you get that light, that beautiful light blue, but also the crystallization structure is, can change based on the uh, pressure and temperature of the water involved you know over time uh, you know usually ice you know make, takes on that snowflake shape of a hexagon but uh it, it can take on more exotic crystalline shapes uh under greater pressure like that found in you know these mythically large uh icebergs anyway i i needed to step aside and narrate that how beautiful how beautiful cried conseil i agree Yes, it's a wonderful sight, is it not, Ned? Yes, confounded, yes, it's superb. I am mad at being obliged to admit it. No one has ever seen anything like it. But the, the sight my, my caught... This accent is going to be the enemy. But the sight may cost us dear. And if I must say all, I think we are seeing here things which God never intended man to see. Ned was right, it was too beautiful. Suddenly, a cry from Conseil made me turn. What is it? Shut your eyes, sir. Do not look, sir. Saying which, Conseil clapped his hands over his eyes. What's the matter, my boy? I'm dazzled. Blinded. My eyes turned involuntarily towards the glass, but I could not stand the fire which seemed to devour them. I understood what happened. The Nautilus had put on full speed. All the quiet luster of the ice walls was at once changed into the flashes of lightning. The fire from these myriads of diamonds was blind. It required some time to calm our troubled, troubled looks. At last the hands were taken down. Faith, I never should have believed it, said Conseil. It was then five in the morning, and at that moment a shock was felt at the bows of the Nautilus. I knew that its spur had struck a block of ice. It must have been a false maneuver for the submarine tunnel, obstructed by blocks, was not very easy navigation. I thought that Captain Nemo, by changing his course, would either turn these obstacles or else follow the windings of the tunnel. In any case, the road before us could not be entirely blocked, but contrary to my expectations, the Nautilus took a decided retrograde motion. We're going backwards? Y yes, this end of the tunnel can have no egress. Then... Then the working's easy. We must go back again go out of the southern opening. That's all. In speaking thus, I wished to appear more confident than I really was, but the retrograde motion of the Nautilus was increasing, and reversing the screw, it carried us at great speed. It will be a hindrance. What does it matter? A few hours, more or less, provided we get out at the end. Yes, provided we do get out at last. For a short time, I walked from the saloon to the library. My companions were silent. I soon threw myself on an ottoman and took a book which my eyes overran mechanically. A quarter of an hour after, Conseil, approaching me, said, Is what you're reading very interesting, sir? Very interesting. I should think so, sir. It's your own book you're reading. My book? And indeed, I was holding in my hand the work on great submarine depths. I didn't even dream of it. I closed my book and returned to my walk. Ned and Conseil rose to go. Stay here, my friends. Uh, let us remain together till we're out of this block. As you please, sir. Some hours passed. I often looked at the instruments hanging from the partition. The manometer showed the Nautilus kept at a constant depth, depth of more than 300 yards. The compass still pointed to south. The log indicated a speed of 20 miles an hour, which in such a cramped space was very great. But Captain Nemo knew that he couldn't hasten too much, and that minutes were worth ages to us. At twenty-five minutes past eight, a second shock took place, this time from behind, and I turned pale. 
My companions were close by my side. I seized Conseil's hand. Our looks expressed our feelings better than words, and at this moment the captain entered the saloon. I went up to him. Our course is barred, uh, our course is barred southward? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. The iceberg has shifted and closed every outlet. We're blocked up, then? Yes. Tell you what. We are on chapter 10, uh, 16. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 chapters left. Uh, uh, you know what? Uh, as much as I want to end on that cliffhanger, I think we've, I think I've got at least one more chapter in me. Provided my teapot has anything more for me. Not a bunch more, but ought to be enough. Let's go one or two chapters more, shall we? Chapter 16, Want of Air. Thus around the Nautilus, above and below, was an impenetrable wall of ice. We were prisoners to the iceberg. I watched the captain. His countenance had resumed its habitual imperturbability. Gentlemen, there are two ways of dying, circumstances in which we're placed. This puzzling person had the air of a mathematical professor lecturing to his pupils. The first is to be crushed. The second is to die of suffocation. I do not speak for the possibility of dying of hunger, for the supply of provisions in the Nautilus would certainly last longer than we shall. Let us then calculate our chances. As to suffocation, Captain, that shouldn't be feared. Our reservoirs are full. Just so, but they'll only yield two days' supply of air. For thirty-six hours we've already been hidden under the water. We've already the, already the heavy atmosphere of the Nautilus requires a renewal. In 48 hours, our reserve will be exhausted. Well, Captain, can we get out of here before 48 hours? We'll attempt it at least by piercing the wall which surrounds us. Uh, on which side? Sound will tell us. I'm going to run the Nautilus aground on the lower bank, and my men will attack the iceberg on the side that is least thick. Captain Nemo went out. Soon I discovered, by a hissing noise, that the water was entering the reservoirs. The Nautilus sank, slowly, and rested on the ice at the depth of 350 yards, the depth at which the lower bank was immersed. Uh, my friends, our situation is serious, but I rely on your courage and energy. Sir, I am ready to do anything for the general safety. Good, Ned. I held my hand out to the Canadian. I will add... That being as handy with the pickaxe as the harpoon, if I can be helpful to the captain, uh, he can command my services. He will not refuse your help. Go, Ned. I led him to the room where the crew of the Nautilus were putting on their cork jackets. I told the captain of Ned's proposal, which he accepted. The Canadian put on his sea costume and was ready as soon as his companions. When Ned was dressed, I re-entered the drawing room where the panes of glass were open. And posted near Conseil, I examined the ambient beds that supported the Nautilus. Some instants after, we saw a dozen of the crew. Oh, excuse me. Some instants after, we saw a dozen of the crew set foot on the bank of ice, and among them Ned Land, easily known by his stature. Captain Nemo was with them. Before proceeding to dig the walls, he took the surroundings. He took the soundings. To be sure of working in the right direction. Long sounding lines were sunk in the side walls, but after fifteen yards they were again stopped by the thick wall. It was useless to attack it on the ceiling-like surface, since the iceberg itself measured more than four hundred yards in height. Captain Nemo then sounded the lower surface. There were ten yards of wall separating us from the water, so great that the thickness of the ice fell. It was necessary, therefore, to cut from it a piece equal in extent to the water line of the Nautilus. There were about 6,000 cubic yards to detach, so as to dig a hole by which we could descend to the ice field. The work had begun immediately, and carried on with indefatigable energy. Instead of digging round the Nautilus, which would have proved greater difficulty, Captain Nemo had an immense trench made at eight yards from the port quarter, and the men set to work simultaneously with their screws on several points of its circumference. 
Presently the pickaxe attacked this compact matter vigorously, and large blocks were detached from the mass. By a curious effect of specific gravity, these blocks, lighter than the water, fled, so to speak, to the vault of the tunnel, that increased in thickness the top of proportion as it diminished at the base. But that mattered little, so long as the lower part grew thinner. After two hours' hard work, Ned Land came in exhausted. He and his comrades were replaced by new workers, whom Conseil and I joined. The second lieutenant of the Nautilus superintended us. The water seemed singularly cold, but I soon got warm enough handling the pickaxe. My movements were free, although they were made under a pressure of thirty atmospheres. When I re-entered, after working two hours to take some food and rest, I found a perceptible difference between the pure fluid with which the Roquai roll engine supplied me and the atmosphere of the Nautilus already charged with carbonic acid. The air had not been renewed for forty-eight hours, and its vivifying qualities were considerably enfeebled. However, after a lapse of twelve hours, we only raised a block of ice one yard thick on the marked surface which was about six hundred cubic yards. Reckoning that it took twelve hours to accomplish this, it would take five nights and four days to bring this enterprise to a satisfactory conclusion. Five nights? Four days? We only have enough air for two days in the reservoir. Without taking into account that even if we get out of this infernal prison, we shall also be imprisoned under the iceberg, shut out from all possible communication with the atmosphere. And that was true enough. Who could foresee the minimum of time necessary for our deliverance? We might be suffocated before the Nautilus could regain the surface of the waves. Was it destined to perish in this ice tomb with all those it enclosed? The situation was terrible. But everyone had looked danger in the face, and each was determined to do his duty to the last. As I expected, during the night a new block a yard square was carried away, and still further sank the immense hollow. But in the morning, when dressed in my cork jacket, I traversed the slushy mass at a temperature of six or seven degrees below zero, I remarked that the side walls were gradually closing in. The beds of water farthest from the trench that were not warmed by the men's work showed a tendency to solidification. In presence of this new and imminent danger, what could become of our chances of safety? How hinder the solidification of this liquid medium that would burst the partitions of the Nautilus like glass? I did not tell my companions of this new danger. What good? What was the good of damping the energy they displayed in the painful work of escape? But when I went on board again, I told Captain Nemo of that grave complication. I know it, he said in that calm tone which would counteract the most terrible apprehensions. It's one danger more. I see no way of escaping it. The only chance of safety is to go quicker than that solidification. We must be beforehand with it. That's all. On this day, for several hours, I used my pickaxe vigorously. The work kept me up. Besides, to work was to quit the Nautilus and breathe directly the pure air drawn from the reservoirs and supplied by our apparatus, and to quit the impoverished and vitiated atmosphere. Toward evening, the trench was dug one yard deeper. When I returned on board, I was nearly suffocated by the carbonic acid with which the air was filled. Oh, if we only had the chemical means to drive away this deleterious gas. We still had plenty of oxygen. All this water contained a considerable quantity, and by dissolving it with our powerful piles, we could restore the vivifying fluid. I had thought well over it, but of what good was that, since carbonic acid produced by our respiration had invaded every part of the vessel? To absorb it, it was necessary to fill some jars with caustic potash to shake them incessantly. Now this substance was wanting on board, and nothing could replace it. On that evening, Captain Nemo ought to open the traps, the taps of his reservoirs, and let some pure air into the interior of the Nautilus. Without this precaution, we could not get rid of these or of the sense of suffocation. The next day, March 26th, I resumed my miner's work in beginning the fifth yard. The side walls and lower surface of the iceberg thickened visibly. It was evident that they would meet before the Nautilus was able to disengage itself. Despair seized me for an instant. My pickaxe nearly fell from my hands. What was the good of digging if I must be suffocated, crushed by the water that was turning into stone? punishment of the ferocity the savages even would not have invented. Just then, Captain Nebo passed near me. I touched his hand and showed him the walls of our prison. 
the wall to port had advanced at least four yards from the hull of the Nautilus. The captain understood me and signed me to follow him. We went on board, and I took off my cork jacket, accompanying him into the drawing room. Monsieur Aronnax, we must attempt some desperate means, means, or we'll be sealed up in this solidified water as in cement. Y yes, but what's to be done? <sighs> my Nautilus was strong enough to bear this pressure without being crushed. Well, I asked, not catching the captain's idea. Do you not understand that this congelation of water will help us? Do you not see that by its solidification it would burst through this field of ice that imprisons us, as when it freezes it bursts the hardest stones? Do you not perceive that it would be an agent of safety instead of destruction? Yes, Captain, perhaps, but whatever resistance to crushing the Nautilus possesses, it couldn't support this terrible pressure. It'd be flattened like an iron plate. I know it, sir. Therefore, we must not reckon on the aid of nature, but on our own exertions. We must stop the solidification. Not only will the side walls be pressed together, but there is not ten feet of water before or behind the Nautilus. The congelation gains on us on all sides. How long will the air in the reservoirs last for us to breathe on board? And the captain looked me in the face. After tomorrow, they'll be empty. A cold sweat came over me. However, on I had to have been astonished at the answer. On March 22nd, the Nautilus was in the open polar seas. We were at 26 degrees. For five days, we'd lived on the reserve on board, and what was left of the respirable air. And what was left of the respirable air must be kept for the workers. Even now, as I write, my recollection is still so vivid that an involuntary terror seizes me, and my lungs seem to be without air. Meanwhile, Captain Nemo reflected silently, and evidently an idea had struck him, but he seemed to reject it. At last, these words escaped his lips. Boiling water. Boiling water? Yes, sir. We are enclosed in a space that is relatively confined. Would not jets of boiling water, constantly injected by the pumps, raise the temperature in this part and stay the congelation? Let's try it. Yes, let's try it, Professor. The temperature then stood at seven degrees outside. Captain Nemo took me to the galleys for the vast distill distillatory machines that furnished the drinkable water by evaporation. They filled these with water, and all the electric heat from the piles was thrown through the worms bathed in the liquid. In a few minutes this water reached a hundred degrees. It was directed toward the pumps while fresh water replaced it in proportion. The heat developed by the troughs was such that the cold water, drawn up from the sea after having gone only through the machines, came boiling into the body of the pump. The injection was begun, and three hours after the thermometer marked six degrees below zero outside. One degree was gained. Two hours later, the thermometer only marked four degrees. We shall succeed, I said to the captain, after having anxiously watched the result of the operation. I think that we shall not be crushed. We have no more suffocation to fear. During the night, the temperature of the water rose to one degree below zero. The injections could not carry it to a higher point, but as the congelation of the seawater produces at least two degrees, I was at least reassured against the dangers of solidification. The next day, March 27th, six yards of ice had been cleared, twelve feet only remaining to be cleared away. There was yet forty-eight hours' work. The air couldn't be renewed in the interior of the Nautilus, and this day would make it worse. An intolerable weight oppressed me. Toward three o'clock in the evening, this feeling rose to a violent degree. Yawns dislocated my jaws, my lungs panted as they inhaled this burning fluid, which became rarefied more and more. A moral torpor took hold of me. I was powerless, almost unconscious. My brave Conseil, though exhibiting the same symptoms and suffering in the same manner, never left me. He took my hand and encouraged me, and I heard him mummer, heard him murmur, rather, Oh, if only I could not breathe so as to leave more air for my master. Tears came into my eyes on hearing him speak thus. Our situation to all was intolerable in the interior. With what haste and gladness would we put on our cork jackets to work in our turn? Pickaxe sounded on the frozen ice beds. Our arms, our arms ached. The skin was torn off our hands. But what were these fatigues? What did the wounds matter? The vital air came to the lungs. We breathed, we breathed. All of this time, no one prolonged his voluntary task beyond the prescribed time. 
his task accomplished, each one handed in his turn to his pant each one handed in turn to his panting companions the apparatus that supplied him with life. Captain Nemo set the example and submitted first to this severe discipline. When the time came, he gave up his apparatus to another and returned to the vitiated air on board, calm, unflinching, unmurmuring. On that day, the ordinary work was accomplished with unusual vigor. Only two yards remained to be raised from the surface. Two yards separated us from the open sea, but the reservoirs were nearly emptied of air. The little that remained ought to be kept to the workers, not a particle for the Nautilus. When I went back on board, I was half suffocated. What a night! I know not how to describe it. The next day my breathing was oppressed. Dizziness accompanied the pain in my head and made me like a drunken man. My companions showed the same symptoms. Some of the crew had rattling in the throat. On that day, the sixth of our imprisonment, Captain Nemo, finding the pickaxes work too slowly, resolved to crush the ice bed that still separated us from the liquid sheet. This man's coolness and energy never forsook him. He subdued his physical pains by moral force alone. By his orders, the vessel was light, that is to say, raised from the ice bed by a change of specific gravity. When it floated, they towed it so as to bring it above the immense trench made on the level of the water line. Then, filling his reservoirs of water, he descended and shut himself up in the hole. Just then, all the crew came on board, and the double door of communication was shut. The Nautilus then rested on the bed of ice, which was not one yard thick, and which the sounding leads had perforated in a thousand places. The taps of the reservoirs were then opened, and a hundred cubic water, hundred cubic yards of water was let in, increasing the weight of the Nautilus to 1,800 tons. We waited, we listened, forgetting our sufferings and hope. Our safety depended on this last chance. Notwithstanding the buzzing in my head, I soon heard the humming sound underneath the hull of the Nautilus. The ice cracked with a singular noise like tearing paper, and the Nautilus sank. You're off, murmured Conseil in my ear. I couldn't answer him. I seized his hand and pressed it convulsively. All at once, carried away by its frightful overcharge, the Nautilus sank like a bullet under the waters. That is to say, it fell as if it was in a vacuum. Then all the electric force was put on the pumps, so that soon began that soon began to let the water out of the reservoirs. After some minutes, our fall stopped. Soon, too, the manometer indicated an ascending movement. The screw, going at full speed, made the iron hull tremble to its very bolts and drew us toward the north. But if this floating under the iceberg is to last another day before we reach the open sea, I shall die first. Half stretched upon a divan in the library, I was suffocating. My face had purpled, my lips gone blue, my faculties suspended. I neither saw nor heard. All notion of time had gone from my mind. My muscles couldn't contract. I did not know how many hours I passed thus, but I was conscious of the agony that was coming over me. I felt as if I was going to die. And then suddenly I came to. Some breaths of air penetrated my lungs. Had we risen to the surface of the waves? Were we free of the iceberg? No. Ned and Conseil, my two brave friends, were sacrificing themselves to save me. Some particles of air still remained at the bottom of one apparatus. Instead of using it, they'd kept it for me. And while they were being suffocated, they gave me life, drop by drop. I wanted to push back the thing. They held my hands, and for some moments I breathed freely. I looked at the clock. It was eleven in the morning. It ought to be the 28th of March. The Nautilus went at a frightful pace, forty miles an hour. It literally tore through the water. Where was Captain Nemo? Had he succumbed? Were his companions dead with him? At the moment, the manometer indicated that we were not more than twenty feet from the surface. A mere plate of ice separated us from the atmosphere. Could we not break it? Perhaps. In any case, the Nautilus was going to attempt it. I felt that it was in an oblique position, lowering the stern and raising the bows. The introduction of water had been the means of disturbing its equilibrium. Then, impelled by its powerful screw, it attacked the ice field from beneath like a formidable battering ram. It broke it by backing and then rushing forward against the field, which gradually gave way, and at last, dashing suddenly against it, shot forwards on the ice field that crushed beneath its weight. The panel had opened, one might say torn off, and the pure air came in abundance to all parts of the Nautilus. 
Okay, folks. As much as I want to continue reading, because <laughs> that's that's such a like that's such a triumphant scene. I want to continue reading. I don't think my voice will allow it of me. So, um oh, I can't even see who's live right now. Uh anyway. Uh, we will be back next week with the last, uh, how many chapters? This is chapter five, six, seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Now uh, we've got seven chapters left, fittingly. We'll be back. We'll be back next week with the last seven chapters. Hopefully, we can get through all seven of them. Uh, this has been paper cuts, and I hope it didn't sting. <laughs> Thank you.